Can you hear oh. me? I can, and I can also see you. Hi. By the way, I tried to download the Avengers mm. uh, just now, and all I ended up with uh, so far, uh, I'm not a huge expert at, <laughs> at, at these various uh, technical things, but I, I, I've i got a, a, a GIF maker mm. thing, but I haven't got the link to the actual clip yet. Ah, I'm, okay. I'm sure it'll... I don't know if you can show it to me, but... Uh, uh, yeah, I might able, yeah, I might be able to show it to you uh, on on here possibly. Um, let me see if I can can do that. Uh, one second. Let's go because it's on my it's on my YouTube um, channel as a private video because the Avengers, despite being a show that's not been on the air for forty five years or so, has some very strict copyright. Um, oh, on. has it really? Oh, really? Uh, Yes, yeah, Studio Canal currently own the Avengers, and they are extremely protective. Yet they don't want to do <laughs> anything with it; that they just want to sit on it, which is kind of odd. They sort of well, um, the, the the other uh, setup that's very difficult to find get programs from is the BBC. Incredibly yeah. difficult, but yeah. uh, it's it's it's, uh, it's an, obviously uh, some of these. Uh, products change hands so many times that some people sometimes people look, lose track of them and don't bother but obviously mm. you say this this is very much under in under copyright yeah oh yeah absolutely and also things like the saint as well very difficult to uh, um uh, and some of it, it, it it's odd because it some of it's U, uk copyright sometimes it's it it's it's us stuff so sometimes certain markets can view it others can't so I think I found the uh, the episode. So I'm just going to see if I can share my screen, and um, hopefully you'll you'll be able to see what I'm what I'm seeing. Right. So you should just probably just see a copy of us at a second. Can you see uh, Patrick McNee? I can see him. Yes. Okay. Let's let's have, give it a quick a quick play. Let's try and put the audio on. I don't know if I can get the audio of it or oh, possibly not. There we are. Oh, oh gosh, yes. Yeah. I'm not sure why I haven't got the audio. Don't worry, I I vaguely remember this. Ah. Um, but but essentially, um, you, you're the the the, the bellboy lift of the lift operator of the villain's sort of penthouse and. Steed has just bribed you to let him um, go up and investigate. And also, I think, um, tr try and if somebody does come and interrupt him to sort of de 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 delay them as much as possible. So you're, well, you're help yes. helping the hero. And this is the original Avengers, isn't it? Yes, this is uh, an episode called Have Guns Will Haggle. Yes, and... well, I, rem I remember that title. But I mean, this is before the new Avengers, isn't it? Oh, oh yes, this is uh, this is sixty eight, and the new Avengers was seventy seven. Right. Um, so a, young, um, a, a younger Patrick McNee, in other words. Oh yeah, yes, yes. I mean, I think he looks very good in the new Avengers, but of course, this is him at, at the height of his uh, height of his powers. So. Um, it was a very whimsical show, wasn't it? It was very sort of. Um, yeah, it's quite quite stylish compared with the Saint, I think. Oh yeah, I think the the, the, the Saint was a bit more gritty, and the Avengers was a bit more sort of um, uh, height of reality, I suppose. Yes, yeah. Oh yes, I don't remember the whole sequence. I remember a couple of shots of it. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Essentially, you would you would delay them as as much as possible so Steed could. Um, um, Doing investigating, and uh, if you go on your IMDb page, um, that's the the main picture of you. Um, they, they... It is actually because I think for for years I didn't have one, and I understood that I had to pay to have one, <laughs> so ah. I didn't bother. And somebody else stuck that there, and so right. it's the only picture I've got, and it's from uh, the Avengers. <laughs> I, I can I know the picture. 
but mm. um, I, and I've I've seen a little bit of that scene because you have. I mean, obviously, you, you presumably can see and understand that all this is a very long time ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's pretty yeah. difficult to remember. Okay, far away. Um, so, well, thank you very much, Robert, for um, wanting to talk to me about your your career. It is is, is very kind of you. Um, you got you got one of those careers that it's quite difficult to sort of think of where to to, to focus. So many uh, so many credits and so many strings to to, to your bow. Um, I was I think my audience might want to initially know um, what attracted you to acting and 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 uh, very briefly sort of how you got into the uh, the business first of all. Well, um, it I th you know I'm I'm being facetious here, but there's some truth in it. <clears throat> I, I I was I was um, being groomed for um, academic stardom at my school. Mm -hmm. I went to a school in Sale, which is just south of Manchester, Sale Grammar, mm -hmm. and. Um, I, you know, I could do the stuff, I could do the, you know. And then um, uh, uh, a bloke turned up, new English master, straight out of the war, hmm. sometimes still wearing combat fatigues, which was not what the headmaster liked, <laughs> <laughs> who was very uh, traditional and far back. Mm. and suited but this man uh, started the the school had had at one time done plays he initiated plays there at uh, stale grammar and because i i was born in france and when i came over here i didn't know a word of english and so i but even at grammar school i still had a very slight foreign accent so mm. he cast me as a foreigner in um in a in a, 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 a play as an italian it was quite yeah. a small yeah. part but it worked rather well and then the next thing i did uh, he then cast me as two leads one as a very old man as one as a a, a roman slave in a, in a plautus play and yeah. at that point i thought I had difficulty imagining myself pursuing, I couldn't fully grasp what people did out there when they left school and what they did didn't seem very inspiring, invigorating, you know, beckoning in any way. And I think, I thought if I can do this, and there seemed to be a response from an audience, and especially, it, I, I happen to the things I do with mostly, and one was a Molière play, which I and mean, they were all funny at some level, mm. and they were effective, and um, <clears throat> I, I began to wonder if this was something that I could. I, I understood that people did this kind of thing professionally. Hmm. And there was a colleague in my class who had already joined a very big amateur dramatic society locally called the Altrium Garrick. All this uh, stuff is in my books, by the way, but mm -hmm. uh, this is a, uh, a summing up. And he had just ahead of me joined this uh, very, they built their own theater. They were a major amateur amdram society of which there are many up north. And so I followed him and I started to actually get cast quite frequently in plays there. And mm. so that led me to think more and more, can I do this instead of going to Manchester University? Mm. And in fact, I got into Manchester. Also, there was this difficult choice that people made, gave one then. I, I, was, I could have gone either into science or the arts. Uh, I was just a toss up and I was mm. told there was slightly more money in science. Yeah. So I got into university, I went into the science sixth form. I got bored very quickly, but I got into Manchester University and turned it down. And instead, I, I actually did an audition for and got into the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London. 
Mm-hmm. So that's, that's that was that's a, a very quick summary of how I ended up as an actor. It avoided being mainstream in society, really, and yeah. becoming an observer and a commentator. And look, this is the kind of person you lot are. Mm. Sometimes I'm this, sometimes I'm that. I represent the sort of person that's out there doing proper jobs. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> But I'm not sure I want to join you. <laughs> and so I've not done a proper job for many, many years. Hmm. And, and I was wondering, uh, by the time um, TV series like The Saint comes along, you're sort of, uh, you're doing, uh, balancing theatre and, and, and TV. I'm, I'm assuming you're sort of going in and out of, of both at that time. Well, rather, again, I write about this, ra- rather... I expected a temple of art when I got, you know, because the further you got away from Rada, the bigger its reputation. In America, it had a huge reputation, and we had a lot of American students come over. But unfortunately, I've now realized that it was at the on its last legs in its then form. The oh. director had been there for a very long time. It was very tired, and the, uh, the uh, level of tuition was not good. And yeah. the, the voice training was extremely good. And there was one really very fine, they called them directors then, who taught us. Uh, the rest, there was one other was, who taught, was, com- was good on comedy. <clears throat> but I, because of my height, I'm rather short. <laughs> I didn't fit into the kind of category that had much to look forward to. The, uh, in the, in as an in an acting career, they knew there were people who did what they called character work, but they mm. didn't know quite how they fitted and how you promoted them. If you were uh, uh, five feet eleven to six feet one and handsome, you mm. just knew there was a career for you if you could act at all. Yeah, even if, even if you could only half act. But being me, it was difficult. I played old men. I played, you know, it was terrible. Um, and got quite a lot of comedy. <clears throat> and so I was not being supported at my drama school by the end at all. But there was a notice on the board which said there were auditions at the Old Vic. And so simply on my, off my own bat, I applied. And mm-hmm. I walked into RADA having done the audition and heard from them, said, I've got a year's work at the Old Vic. Right. And the the company was headed by Richard Burton and Claire Bloom that right. year. Yeah. Uh, Michael Horden was a major player and so on. Robert Hardy was there. Uh, and so uh, I people's jaws faintly dropped, but they kind of said, oh, well done. And in fact, the effect, the outcome of my being at the Vic was that I got a second year at the old Vic. But because of the state of drama at that period, mm. the 50s, I came out for, for 1953, <laughs> it was just the beginning of modernity, television, yeah. um, mm. um, Plays that were chatted, you know, the, the, the sort of um, dramatic stage proclaiming mode was rapidly disappearing. Hmm. And if you'd been in, um, uh, if you'd been in a company that only did classical drama for two years, it was in fact it was just Shakespeare. Hmm. You, uh, you, I realized very quickly, if you walked in and you were uh, up for an ordinary television or a, some sort of ordinary, you know, run-of-the-mill uh, uh, f- bit of TV filming or something, they immediately thought you couldn't be modern, you couldn't be normal and natural and casual. They thought mm. you would come on and say, you know, would you mind opening the door, please? Or whatever, mm. you know, pass me the butter. They couldn't understand. They, they wanted you just to chat and mumble. And so it was the weirdest situation. They said, What have you done? And I couldn't say, I've just done two years solid 
with a classical company doing amazing Shakespeare with amazing people, I had mm. to say, well, I've uh, been doing a bit of theatre, you know, and, and hope that my reading would convince them that I could be a sort of natural or new human being. So it was, mm. a, it was a kind of restart. And it was very bizarre. So you know, I, I don't know how much you know about the, the profession. Of these women, I'm, I'm, sorry, I've got a, a fair bit from an amateur point of view, but uh, yeah. Yes, you, have you ever acted yourself? Uh, I think it was um, uh, Hungry Boy Number Four in Oliver when I was at secondary school, so if that counts. But um, but but no, I've, I've always had, it's like music. I've, I I admire people who can play, but unfortunately, I'm I'm just you know sitting there as a fan really. Well, it's a very funny, it's an extraordinary trade. If you're not marked, as I uh, indicated just now, mm. then you're just literally looking for any way of entering anywhere at all. Mm. So the only thing to do is to just um, graft away. And there was a strange period because I came out of Brada with nobody expecting anything from someone like me much. Mm. <clears throat> you know, you fend for yourself. And I therefore didn't have an agent. Uh, for my, uh, uh, after two years tuition at Rada, <clears throat> we were only given one public performance. I did get in only uh, 90, there were 90 candidates, but only 45 got parts and only 15 of those were worth playing. And I ended up trying to sell myself at the age of 19, playing somebody of 65. Nice. <laughs> I got a very nice letter from Felix Aylmer saying, I thought you'd have got a, a, a prize of some kind. But I was, by then I was, I couldn't, I wasn't, I didn't find myself very convincing. So I was, I was rather quiet and it was a big theatre, it was the Phoenix Theatre. But anyway, you know, I was encouraged by this. But I saw so that all I did was I used to pick up the phone. And in those days, if you picked up the phone, uh, you could get sometimes straight to a director. You could ring up the BBC and ask for this or that office and emerging ITV. Mm -hmm. And not, not, uh, it was quite, it wasn't rare, it was quite frequently the director himself would pick up and I said, look, I'm turned, so I've, I've been at the Ovic, but I'm now looking for, you know, I gather you're doing this crime drama, you know, is there anything? And they would say, and they always, the first thing I would say, are you in spotlight? And I said, yes, yes, at what page, this page? And I remember uh, somebody I rang at the BBC, there was a series going on about the life of Jesus Christ. Hmm. And I rang up like this. Are you in spotlight? Yes. Oh, well, uh, can you come in on Tuesday? Hmm. I went in on Tuesday and I got the part of the disciple Matthew. Right. Who was one of Jesus' major followers. Hmm. So at the age of about, oh, I don't know, 24 or younger, I was playing 35, bearded and, you know, but it was a wonderful series to be in. A man called Tom Fleming played Jesus. And it was very uh, edgy because here was Jesus actually appearing live on television. You mm. know, it was uh, the papers were all over it because uh, a lot of, you know, right wing people thought it was, you know, and the church was, should Jesus appear pale? appear live on television, you know, and it was family viewing. It was about six o'clock six o'clock in the evening. So that's what it was like. You just did what you could. You rang people. And for mm. nine years, I did that without an agent. And mm. finally, I had I was on there enough for somebody to say, oh, by the way, so-and-so in Charing Cross Road, they're, they're quite good. You might want to ask them if, they, if they'll be your agent. And I got taken on. And in mm. fact, that's that's how I got into comedy. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the comedy in, in, in a moment, but it must have been quite quite exciting to get roles in things like 
the, the, the saint although it's a small world it's quite a nice a, a nice little nice little piece and you get a nice little uh a, a, a death scene at the end and um uh did did, did the show have a, a cachet to you at that time was it was it nice to get something like the same? It, 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 at that time, it was just, thank God I've got another job. Mm. I mean, it was yeah. literally that. And some parts were more interesting to play than others. I think the, the new Avengers is quite a nice character. It and is. That, that engineer, yeah. that's quite a nice character. Mm. Uh, and and so on. But it, it was, I've got another part. I've got, I'm being asked to act somewhere. You yes. know, in my own head, I have to say, coming, I wouldn't have minded spending my life in, you know, playing Ibsen, Strindberg, Shakespeare, whoever, for the mm. rest of my life, because I thought this was the greatest drama that could be. But yeah. that was simply absolutely not on. Someone mm. had to sort of hawk oneself on the high street, you know, and yeah. say, I'm for sale, I'm for sale, I'll do anything. And that's how, that's just how it was. And so, um, you know, I, I looked out, people, people obviously actors uh, helped each other by saying, by the way, so, so-and-so's casting, so-and-so's this, so-and-so's that, and somebody mm-hmm. picked you up. And it was, odd, it was frankly odds and ends. And there mm-hmm. was no consistency of any kind. It was just... Um, you know, could could you fit into this part, given the height I was and the way I looked, you know? Mm. And it wasn't until I got an agent that there was any kind of uh, beginning to place. Otherwise, you just did whatever that was available. And that's uh, that's one of the reasons, of course, I, I had to return to the theatre, uh, mm. which ended up... I, I, I never admired what I found in rep. But I, I, I returned to the, the theatre. So that I think the first was, was a weekly rep, which I thought was extraordinary that anybody could believe that you could do a, a play, you know, a properly written play in a week. And you couldn't, of course. Mm. It was, if, you weren't, if you weren't playing in the evening, you had a better chance than but most of them, of course, once you were on, they were working at night and rehearsing all day. Mm. So it was absolutely nonsense. It was a very poor standard by and large. But, uh, I, um, you know, it, one had to do it. And uh, I was a dip switch rep and so on, and uh, Coventry. Mm. So that was inter- interspersed with with bits of television. And it's a, it's a rag bag. It's a, it's a rat race and a rag bag. And you just dart about like a... Like yeah. a frenzied animal looking for scrap. It's like a, a you know feral animal, animal stalking the streets looking for anything that's been dropped. You know. Yeah. Um, I, I I I I did. Um, I was wondering whether it was a coincidence that Robert Asher directed Your Saint and also the Have Guns Will Haggle episode of The Avengers. I assume I, I assume that was a coincidence. It wasn't necessarily that that they remembered you from a previous um, adventure sort of thing. You'd have to ask him, and I'm sure he's dead. Um, b- probably. <laughs> I, he, no, that, I, a director did work like that. Yeah, yeah. That's what I thought that, yeah. It, it, I, 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 he may have done that. I, you, I had, hadn't clocked that he was the same director, but that yeah. did happen a lot. Because if mm. somebody, I mean, you know, the absolutely key to any director's life is reliability mm. <laughs> if you find somebody can do a kind of odd little part and is absolutely reliable then you'll mm. use him again so yeah that may very well have happened yeah um because i don't know if you're aware of the history of how guns were haggle but it was a, a story that had been partially shot and then a, a one director um went out another one came in it, and there was also a third director as well but the but the common thread in terms of your career is a guy called Raymond Austin and he is the one that has the final credit for that episode and he also directed a professionals that you did as as well uh, the episode rogue so oh um, really yeah yeah so but, I could I don't remember that at all yeah. and the point is that again <clears throat> the way you shoot these things mm. if you've got a little part and mm. it's just with one or more people. You only yeah. ever meet those people. You yes. don't meet 
the other stars or anything mm. uh, when you're playing a small part you mm. have to <clears throat> you have to have an extended part of some kind mm. f- for uh, well, there to be any chance whatever <laughs> of meeting mm. the other principal players otherwise you just you know you go to the lot i mean eventually i drove myself but you find your way to the the shooting the studio you know, and they they get you done as quickly as they possibly can because it's all money. Yes, yeah. You know. And do, do you have a, a a preferred studio? Because you did did obviously Doctor Elstree, but also Pinewood. Does one? Um... No, no. It was just uh, I, eventually they were both quite a drive. So you yeah. thought, all oh, right, yeah. you had to make sure you remembered which one to go to, that's all. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> which day, you know, sort of thing. But that was fine. And of course, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And you had the one thing, the one perk was free meals, you know, yeah. location caterers, you know. Mm. Yeah. So um, actors absolutely stuffed themselves on free okay. food when they were there. Yeah. Um, I mean, what's quite nice with your new Avengers episode is that there is a fair bit of location work. And did any memories come back when you when you saw the episode? I, I appreciate it's a, a a long time ago. Well, that's the one that people have flashed past me more often than mm. most most of them. Yeah. <clears throat> I I really don't remember the day at mm. all, but I I could see what was happening and. Uh, and only recently have I caught up with the with the whole episode, so I knew how I fitted in, and also why Robert Lang was how he was, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And um, but I I have to say, I mean, I have a vague general idea of mm-hmm. Elstree and Pinewood and mm-hmm. those huge warehouse studios and and the kinds mm-hmm. of lots and the car parks and everything, <clears throat> but I can't I couldn't remotely tell you about the individual day not at oh, all yeah. yeah and i suppose the actors as well they kind of unless you work for somebody for a long period of time they don't tend to sort of leave that's like right people. i mean mm. you know, eventually i did a uh, a whole series called for called free wheelers mm. where i did 13 episodes but we were a very tight group no i i was i was the clever buddy and neil mccarthy was the th- Thick body, <laughs> and then there was Wendy Padbury and the young man. Uh, okay, I can't remember his name, but you know, I would, I will always remember those ones who were always together, hmm. yeah. because we were constantly trying to do horrible things to them. Hmm. <laughs> they were always together. Hmm. And, and were you a, a TV fan in those days? Would you watch things like The Saint and The Avengers? Were you familiar when you went into those shows? I, I, uh, I, well, again, I have to uh, confess, mm. um, it's, it's not central to what I would watch for no. my own enjoyment on a regular basis. But I mm. always checked up what they were, what they were like, and what was, what was expected of one. I mean, mm. one did one's homework. Because yes. if you're, you, you know, otherwise you thought, what am I supposed to do? I mean... I mean, the new Avengers, it seems to me, there's a very nice slight tongue-in-cheek feeling about the mm-hmm. thing. I mean, it's, it doesn't take itself over seriously. It's, it's, there's a touch of fantasy about it, which is... And mm-hmm. it, so it's, it's, it's quite light. Yeah. So one doesn't... The one that, you know, it's not like being a really heavy crook or anything. Uh, mm-hmm. that would, it wouldn't fit. So it's it's good to know the the genre, you know, the kind of thing it is. So mm. that I so I obviously one would watch anything that that would educate one to know what was going what one was going into. But I put, wouldn't particularly want want to see what was the end of. Oh, I must see this episode. If somebody said there's a fantastic episode, you really must see it. I'd watch it, you know. Mm. But I was always into uh, information programs. I would watch. You know, just about anything about science and wildlife and whatever, you know, or <clears throat> politics or whatever, uh, assiduously. Uh, and of course, uh, there, there were great television dramas. There were some absolutely wonderful television mm. drama, you know, but uh, se- uh, episodes of series like that 
wouldn't be top of my list to watch. But I mean, frankly, I mean, you know, being an actor is extremely whorish. I mean, you're just, you're, you're a tart, really. You know, you're just, you're up for sale. And mm. so, you, you, you know, it doesn't matter what, I mean, there are very things that most actors would draw a line under and say, I, I won't be in that. There yeah. are, there are obviously lines, but there are many. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, you, you said you had a quite a prolific comedy career, Porridge, Rising Damp, Up Pompeii. Is there, is there, do you have any favourites amongst... Uh... Well, well, again, you see, um, I don't tell jokes. Mm. I, I can, I, if I'm in company, I find that people laugh, but I don't tell jokes. I know a lot of actors. I mean, George, I don't know if you know an actor called George, George Pravda. Have you ever heard of George Pravda? Yes, he was that. very, very important. Mm. You come across him. Mm. <clears throat> I was once on location with him in Zurich, and we it was a time when they were wasting a lot of the Americans. They were being given the runaround, and they were <laughs> the crew was wasting a lot, was a lot, wasting money. And so we had a lot of free time. And yeah. George and I got, got together, and we just walked down. We spent the day walking and, eat, and eating. And he would tell joke after joke after joke all day. And then the next day, it would be different jokes. I said, how many do you know? I said, I've never counted. I said, you must write this down. It's amazing. You know, he said, well, maybe 3,000. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't tell jokes. Mm. And in fact, in one of my books, I compare... He had a, he told me a joke and he said, "Ah, oh, I sometimes I sometimes tell that one." And I said, how do you how do you deliver the payoff? Hmm. And he said, "I always come in quickly with the payoff." Uh, 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 he said, and "I said I always uh, give a little pause." And so we there was that kind of thing about how you play comedy. Hmm. And so what how, all the the way I so I didn't expect to be in comedy at all in hmm. sitcom. Because I, on the whole, didn't watch sitcom for a start. I knew it existed. <clears throat> but then the first, my first agent, it was purely accidental. I, the, I had on my CV that I could do a French accent and a German accent, having been born on the, on the continent and for various reasons, I could claim to do those. Because the first language I ever spoke was French. <clears throat> so she said, well, they're doing this series with Hugh Lloyd and Terry Scott. Hmm. Because Hugh and I, spy, they think has got a bit tired and they're sending them abroad. So they, uh, so they sent them to various locations purportedly, hmm. all in various parts, I think, bits of Europe. Hmm. and Africa and so they sent me along to play a French desk inspector sergeant and I was there because of the French accent but in hmm. fact it was a very nice funny script and I was dealing with this, I think it was Terry crazy idiot and being uh, you know a, a, a long-suffering uh, official dealing with the idiot. Uh -huh. So that's, that's always a very nice, that's a very good script. Hmm. And of course, David Croft was directing it. Yeah. And that's what set me off in sitcom. And yeah. this too, eventually, my, my having is written for me. Can you still hear me? I can still hear I've lost your picture, uh, unfortunately. But can you hear me? I can hear, I can hear you okay, but I've lost your picture. Hopefully it'll catch up in a second. Um, yes. So anyway, um, so having worked once for, for David Crawl, Mm-hmm. It it started the whole the, the whole thing off sort of thing. Okay. I I can 
Uh, you've frozen again, unfortunately. Uh, yes. After, after that... <laughs> maybe someone switched on the kettle. I don't know. <laughs> yes, possibly. Um, yeah, as I was saying, uh, it, that's, that's what started it all off. And then just as I described... Once people mm. find that you can do something, mm. uh, they say, "Well, he can do this, so let's we can cast him." Yeah, and 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 w this is a private thing to myself mm. because um, I think, as I describe in the book, when you came out of Rada, uh, the wisdom then was get yourself typecast as f soon as possible. And then you have a career for life playing roughly one sort of character because everybody mm. will find that useful, reliable, and uh, you know, and will cast you. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I want, uh, to me, acting was about reading a script and saying, I wonder what this character is, is about. You know, what's this person like? Mm. And the weird thing about ending up in sitcom was that I, I did lots of single episodes hmm. playing different people. Yes. And so I avoided being typecast for a very big chunk of my life. Hmm. And yeah. so I don't think I've ever been typecast as anything, except hmm. the nearest thing I got, as I say, uh, as I mentioned to people, is, is playing small-time crooks. But oh. that went away quite quickly, quickly once, I, um, once I got, started being funny. Hmm. Yeah. Be, because people just uh, started to use me to be funny. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think, as you say, when you appeared in the... the connection, in... Has the connection gone again? Uh, you, you come come back, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, uh, I think what you, you were saying is, I, I suppose when you did things like The Saint and The Avengers and The New Avengers, that was very much the, the small-time crook sort of, you, you know, that you were getting pigeonholed. Oh, well, uh, at that well no, I don't think... No, no, no. I, no, there was an actual line of crooks. Hmm. I mean, actual crooks. Yeah. Can you hear me now, Robert? Yes, I can hear you now. Yes. Yeah. So, so you say the actual crooks that were playing the. Um... Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, it, yeah. it, what, what I regard the the Saints at the Avengers as just bit parts. They were just, but they were those characters were not criminals. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so when I say crooks, I mean crooks. Mm. I, I I began to be used to be a, a crook, mm. and um, I mean the, one of the best best ones I had was in a show that I can't get out of, which was for the BBC called Dead Easy, mm. where I I was a kind of fairly major small time crook, mm. <laughs> but in the the, the can you still hear me? I still hear you okay. Yeah, still got you. Yeah, I've got you, I've got you again. Yep. Yes, in in um, in, uh, in the professionals, in, mm. in professionals, in the long shot. Do, do, do you uh, remember I, that? I, I do. Yes, I do. Yep. In long in in the episode called Long Shot. Hmm. Well, that that's the kind of crook I mean. Hmm. <laughs> yes, that's absolutely the sort of part I mean. I was I began to be. 
cast quite a lot like mm. the not that was quite hard yes but it was often just you know but, but the, thing, the, thing, the thing that saved me from that was sitcom because I, I just played every possible thing in all that mm. it's in situation comedy mm. And one other thing, you meant in your email, you mentioned Annette Andre. What were you going yeah. to do with her? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I, I've, I'm, I'm very pleased to say I've done a few events with, with her in the past. Oh, um, you have, I see. A, a, a lovely lady. And um, we're going to do um, a couple of the Saints um, next. We've done other things, but we're going to do, do a couple of Roger Moore, uh, Roger Moore Saints. So that should be quite, uh, quite interesting. But, um, oh, right. yeah. Yeah, she, she's she's really, really lovely. I recommend sort of looking at her work. No, I just but wondered uh, how she is. You know what, what? Because you you indicated something in relation to what we were doing, so I wondered what that was about. Oh, well, well, she was in um, in the oh, same yes, episode was, yeah. as you, but of course, I, yes. I, I admittedly I didn't quite realise how short lived your character was when I made the and connection. Not, not only that, yes. I never met her. Yes. Yeah. You yeah. know, because we were completely separate. Hmm. Yeah. And so I was a, ma- a minor character. I would have been got rid of in in, in shooting terms very quickly and, yeah. and away. So I never met her. Yeah. Um, so I, obviously, uh, when we do the event, I will, I'll, I'll, po- I'll point her, you know you out to her and stuff. But um, but but yeah, that there is a connection to to that. Yeah, world. We, were in, we were in the same show. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes that's okay. Right. Well, good to, good to meet you. And, uh, and uh, till the next time. Until next time. Love, lovely to uh, to meet you, Robert. Okay. Ta-ra for now. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Hi, hey, Robert. Can you hear me okay? Hello, Philip. Hi, Robert. How are you? I'm absolutely fine. And yourself? Yeah, not bad at all. Not bad. Good, good. You um had a nice week so far. You've had you've had a nice week. Oh well, I have, but I was I was just saying, uh, have you? Had oh you? no, I'm I'm absolutely fine. Yes, yes. Uh, um, things continue to be pretty interesting. I'm working on a quite a big project with my designer because oh, yes. um, um, years ago <laughs> I got to know Peter Jones rather well. Do you? Do you remember who Peter Jones was? Does ring a bell. Um, Good. <laughs> um, he's probably best known for being the voice in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yes, yes, yes. I knew but but he was yeah. a, a very talented writer and actor in situation comedy. He, right. he wrote a lot of stuff himself. And we, um, I was on a couple of shows that he wrote, he'd written and was starring in like mm. Bigger My Neighbour and um, uh, things like that. And um, he, he, we were chatting and he said, between us, we ought to write a book, because he wrote a lot of sitcom, and he said, we ought to write, be able to write a good sitcom. And we had an idea. I had a, We were crossing Trafalgar Square, I think it was, and I suddenly had this idea, and he said, fantastic. So we wrote a very good, we thought it was very good, episode one, and then something happened in his private life, hmm. which uh, I describe in my book, so I won't spoil it for people who haven't yet bought the book, uh, hmm. and those who have, uh, uh, which changed everything. And he began to be distracted. And uh, hmm. But we've got this one episode, and my designer and I, 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 I um, uh, flashed it past him. And uh, he's working on a way for us to present it. And it's very much of its time. It's absolutely mm. the Thatcher era. It's 80s, right. you know, uh, uh, everything, um, greed is good, you know, everything, any way of mon- money, making money, everything, nothing is worth anything if it doesn't make money and so on. And it was that... Uh, <laughs> It was that that was the inspiration behind this episode. So that's the sort of thing I'm I'm working on at the moment, mainly, mainly that kind of thing, you know. Mm. Uh, 
Oh, I, I attended the, um, you may have come across this, uh, uh, Robert Ross held um, a sitcom day at, at Watford, at the Pump House Theatre at Watford, uh, <clears throat> with yeah. several people uh, from, from different sitcoms. It was Brian Murphy and his wife, but all of us present had written books. So the deal was we we turned up for his event and we could sell our books. And so that was <laughs> kind oh, of the last thing I did. Yeah. Oh, sounds, sounds, sounds very nice. With, with your project with Peter Jones, are you going to do it as, um, are you going to actually perform it in some? No, some no, it's, um, no, we, we, there's several possibilities. Uh, we, we're going to present it. One at the moment, we're, we're thinking of presenting it as a script for mm. people to read, but illustrated mm. plus one interesting possibility, which I won't mention until we've got a bit further with it. Mm. So we'll, we're going to bring it to life uh, in, a, in a way that couldn't have been thought of then. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, and, and see, see uh, how it works. And uh, in fact, my designer, Paul, has, um, we, we've got this idea that uh, depending on the response, <laughs> that we ask people to contribute. And uh, uh, the question would be, what do you think happened next? Oh, so it becomes like a continuation. Uh, or... So that people yeah. can maybe write, write their own next episode or next two episodes and yeah. see what they come up with, you know, and just put it on the website and talk about it and that sort of thing so uh he's uh where it where where paul and i will be in touch at the end of the week because he started working on uh <clears throat> some of the uh, well some of the visual design elements as mm -hmm. opposed to the uh, other possibilities mm -hmm. so uh, i don't know yet what he's come up with but we've had we've had some chats Oh, so that sounds, sounds very good. Well, one thing that was quite popular during lockdown was table reads of um, particularly things that didn't get made at the time or yes, what have yes, you. And, and yes. you know, that's obviously one format that might might suit it. But uh, that's, um... I think what we wanted, uh, we've moved towards the making it more of a fixture and something evol evolving that's there anyway for mm. people to enjoy. And then yeah, the yeah. fact that it was. Uh, uh, you know, in that field, it was Peter's last work. I mean, mm -hmm. I've got another piece, which is a play of his, <laughs> which we t we were writing together, which mm -hmm. we might bring, you know, make public a bit later. But yeah. sitcom was his main thing. It was what, comedy was his, what he was very well known for, and uh, yeah. uh, it'll be like um, um, an unexpected voice from the past, you know. Hmm. Because yeah. he, I, 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 I wasn't in touch with him to at the right, right at the very end. So I, I, I don't know what got him in the end. He was quite old, I think, hmm. but I, I, I didn't uh, discover what it was. Yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds like a lovely project, and I wish you well. But uh, well, well I, I'll lovely. tell you all about it when, yeah. when we know more, when we, when there's more to share with people. That that would be be lovely. Um, I, I reviewed our, our last conversation, and a lot of it is is very usable. One thing that worked quite nicely was when we when I shared the screen and we looked at your original Avengers episode. Oh um, yes, I think people were quite quite to see see it in in, in that format, um, which gave me an idea, if you don't mind, um, to show a bit of the new Avengers and just have a little talk a bit yeah. about general TV stuff. Uh, as, you know, if that's okay. While you're speaking about that, <clears throat> uh, somebody else who was in touch with me, uh, which was about um, uh, Frankenstein must be destroyed in the Hammer film. Mm. Well, he's a great fan of that particular one. He he, he thinks it's the best of them. Yeah. But the, he he flagged up that, that there was a scan. There was a moment which um, people got very upset about. Mm. And it turns out that it was uh, 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 insisted on by the management. It was a, apparently a kind of near-rape scene with Peter Cushing and his co-star. And mm. uh, 
I noticed in the Avengers that you sent me when I was eventually able to play it. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if this has ever come up in terms of people being, um, you know, um, shaken or shocked by what used to be possible. But mm. uh, because you've interviewed Annette Andre, I don't, I don't you remember, there is a scene in that in which Roger Moore spanks her. Yes. Do you remember um, that? Uh, that is, yes, in the uh, your episode, yes. That's right. Um, yeah. Do, how, how does she react to that now, uh, Annette? Uh, we haven't touched on that particular moment, but oh, right. it'll be an interesting question that I will I will put to her. Um, I, 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 I think maybe a lot of TV back in the 60s and 70s, perhaps some of the comedies that you might have been involved with, would you perhaps get away with everything Oh, no, this is what's interesting. Practice. This is what's interesting mm. about it. Yeah. I mean, it's obviously very old in terms of most of the people. It was about 40, 40 odd, 45 years old. But the point is, that was acceptable at the time. It well, would absolutely not be shown now. No. And, and no actress would accept it. No. So it's fascinating how, you know, in, in, that, in, a, in a few decades, how things change. I think that's very interesting. Oh, absolutely. And I know I think on sets now that they have intimacy coordinators. So absolutely. They, so it's actually very sort of, uh, I was talking to Malcolm McDowell actually a, a few weeks ago and he was, even though he's in his, he's now turned 80, he he was on a set and, and he had a scene with um, a love interest and they still had an intimate coordinator, even though, you know, and it's a well-known actor, you know, so it's it's interesting, isn't it? How it's kind of changed, you know, but um so uh, yes, I think what we'll do, Robert, is we'll have a little look at uh, the, yeah, okay. the Avengers to talk about a spark us, spark us off. Um, let's see if I can. Okay. Hopefully, you'll we'll be able to hear the episode as well as me. I've done a little little test earlier, so hopefully. Okay. Well, having said that, it's bound to go terribly wrong now. Um, so, so here's your episode, uh, Last of Cybernaut. So it should start with your reveal from the um, HM prison. Um, there you, can you see that okay, Robert? Yeah, that's okay. Good. Um, I mean, of course, this is 45 years ago. Is it easier to watch stuff that you've been in when it's a long, long time ago? Can you sort of separate yourself from actually watch it as... Well, I'm thinking all oh, Frank me and you know what's I doing you know uh, it, 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 none of it bothers me either way mm. <laughs> yeah since you've always been one of that actors that could quite happily watch themselves and you know it's not because I know a lot of actors don't like looking at watching their performances and oh um, really um oh, you know, I've never... to um Darren Nesbitt recently and I said, if I sent him, like, like I did of you, send him some of his stuff, he said, oh, no, I, I never watch my my, my stuff. So um, I think it depends on the, on the person. Really. Oh, right. Uh, no, I, I've always been curious uh, yeah. to see how it comes over now and all that kind of thing. Yeah. But I suppose as, as an actor, you need to be very aware of, of your facial expressions and what your, what's coming across on the screen. So I suppose... Watching yourself is helpful in, in that I respect. I would have invited you to my home, Mr. Cuff, but I couldn't be sure you would come, so you were abducted. But I so wish this is, um, we didn't mention last time, but this is um, Robert Lang playing the villain Felix Kane. I don't know if you encountered him on any, anything else know, other than the, 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 the Avengers. I don't remember Clear working with him, no. Of course, he's an extremely well-known actor. So. A drink. Hmm. And uh, Oscar uh, Quittock is um, yes. um, Marloff, again, a very good, good villain. You must hate him very much. It was a but long when time you ago. are in, and you're guessing on, is it always a bit sort of, uh, you, you're a bit unsure what it would be Michael, like because you're coming into an established cast? Is it always a bit, or how, how am I going to sort of fit in? Is, is that always perhaps, a slight no, concern? If you can't get used dead. to that, you shouldn't be in the train. No, no, <laughs> but I suppose it starts to, uh, you know, it, 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 it just absolutely comes with, with, 
you just hope it's going to work, you know. I am pleased mm. to see uh, you. Uh, you. You can never tell, uh, but uh, it, in my experience, it was very rare to walk into a really fraught um, or antithetical situation. I mean, I can't offhand remember thinking, oh my God, all this is terrible, you know. Mm. Uh, yes. it, it, it's uh, nobody's yes, getting better. on, or they're all fighting, or whatever. Man's face. Uh, yeah. It was usually don't agree. the now, rewarding the thing, really, the attractive thing strong. was that most of these things were extremely professional, and because there was a lot of money involved, um, they happened as quickly as possible. But yeah. no, nobody and tried to. Everybody hoped not Mrs. to do re Emma retakes. Feels. Fires. Not to make mistakes. Yes or no. <laughs> Speak up, Mr. Garth. That's correct. Now. Uh, well, having seen the episode uh, again, how do you think it holds up in terms died, of it, the story, its tone? I think it's an interesting episode. Well, it struck me that it was a very good build-up. It was a, extremely well, and and then the 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 payoff is very surprising <laughs> when it comes. You know. And that you know its location. Uh, and Robert Lang, I think, is, is, is very. I am willing to pay. Kind of see very a little bit of his injuries, but not really. So. I am willing to go. We had a party, Mrs. Ware. Birthday party. Still with me, Robert? Yes, I'm here. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I think um. I lost my connection slightly. I, I, was, I was just saying um, this was uh, the third Cybernaut nice. episode, um, basically birthday. finishing off the, the, the trilogy. Um, originally, the, um, Michael Goff had been in the, in the first one as... Uh, to Michael Goff on, it, on anything in your I'm career? Uh, I don't remember working... No, uh, I'm not sure I worked with Michael so, Goff. Miracle I'm not sure. I, I can't remember now uh, specifically. It's mm. quite difficult to remember things in detail as far back as this. I can tell you. That, that yeah. is the real. I, I almost have to research it to find out what was going on, you know. Mm. So it's, it's, sometimes it's a bit. Look, look, sometimes looking at some of your work, it's almost like maybe. Oh, hello, Jack. It, I mean, sort of, if you don't. Sometimes you don't sort of get a a feeling of doing it at all maybe perhaps uh once, yes, yes, once, yes. when i uh, i used to, people used to show me very short clips of this particular episode mm. and i remember not remembering Thank any you. of the, the detail of any fun. of the complexity at all right but then one when i finally saw the whole thing um it, it, it i it all made sense. It all made absolute sense. And I could almost remember driving up to the studio and parking the car and, <laughs> you know, getting going going into makeup, getting my costume and all that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. um, uh, with a, it, it, it required the calmly, reminder calmly. of, of no, really watching the whole thing mm. to put it in place, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I think you were saying last time that you... Um, Digger for a phase where you were playing sort of villainous roles, much like like this one, also things like the professionals and not got pigeonholed, but it but it's something you came a bit known for. Yes, well, when I first, I mean, the way I broke into television uh, was that, uh, at, in, in several different directions. One of the things I did was work for a, a couple of extremely good directors. Um, uh, for, uh, for BBC Schools Television. Hmm. Uh, do, 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 have you ever heard of somebody called Ronald Eyre? That, I, 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 that, does, that does sound familiar, yeah. Well, he became a major director uh, in the West End and so on and so on. And he also was a writer. Well, I worked a lot for him. And it, we did. he did major oh, stuff in schools television, beautiful. and so did a Trust woman me. called Rosemary Hill, and I worked a lot with huge yes. classical uh, scripts and all According that. Mm. Then quite separately, there was the commercial world, yes, and just at the beginning, uh, I mean, this, this wouldn't uh, be in the same category, 
Because, I mean, it, this guy is meant to be some sort of engineer, isn't he? Yeah, he's more of a, a porn, unfortunately, kind of... Um, yeah, he's caught up in it rather than perhaps being, That's you know, right. the, the driving force. But, but, but I was literally, because of my looks and my um, general oh, appearance and my height, hmm. the thing that people seem to think of for, you know, a few years, six or seven yeah. years, if if there was anything was going, snooker. I was hmm. sent up for literally small-time crooks. I mean, I, I might have a reasonably large part, but the, hmm. I didn't play Mr. Big ever. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I was always usually some sidekick, you know, some lower in the pecking order character, <laughs> criminal sometimes. Unfortunately, in a way, in crude terms, it was situation comedy that got me away from it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, then I suppose the thing that happened with comedy, where you always associate with comedy, and you're kind of offered every comedy that that. that you know, it was available sort of thing. Trouble. The the only Golf, requirement Golf. in sitcom, no, prison, yes. as far as I was, well, as far as seen, I, it 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 he's involved me sight. was mm. to get my laughs, nothing else. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, one of the nice things that must be about being on a big production like this, because there was quite a bit of money in the New Avengers, that you do get quite some quite nice sets. The sets well, where. You discover the sleeping cybernauts where they're being well, kept is quite a it's quite a nice to that atmospheric. Um, um, do you, do you find yourself, you know, big productions? Do I what? What was that last? Oh, do, do, is, is it nice to work on a big production like like this that is designed has a good design and it's is that something you sort of notice? Oh, absolutely. Yes. I mean, it, uh, <clears throat> this is a. Uh, as you say, the design is rather classy. But the mm. point is that that, that period, uh, I have no idea about the leads, but I think it probably involved them. People were not very well paid. Mm. The people that got the money were the producers, you know, the people. And um, uh, it, was, it was as true for, this is an independent production like this, I mean, they got you for as little as possible, designs. and they and they managed it. What one relied on right. was trying to keep so regularly in work the because the work itself was not particularly builder, well paid. I suppose. Hmm. But it, and then there was a weird period which happened. You would be of I think it, be ha it started That's in about 1985 you would be incapable of onwards that design when Look, I'm an engineer. people started like being paid absolutely silly money. I mean, you know, asking, I mean, money that when, when people told me what was available, what people were getting, it was completely unbelievable. And I never got into that league. I, th I think, um, yeah, as soon as one act has paid a certain price at a certain level, that's it, isn't it? Sort of, it all has to go up. Well, it, it, as I say, it changed. I don't know whether it was an American influence or what it was exactly, but or, or whether actors got wise and clever and their agents as well, and that um, they started saying, you know, I think it was influenced by American men. People got to hear what Americans got for the for similar work. Yes, mm. and, uh, and 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 it became, I mean. Unrecognizable. There was no comparison, whatever. Right. And it was, and I never got. I, I, done most of my work oh, sure. by then. Like I did. I went on working, of course, but um, not at the same level. Oh, if I'd yeah. done Keep It in the Family, say even five years later mm -hmm. <laughs> than I did, I'd have been making money in a in a completely different league. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's quite interesting historically. Oh, absolutely. The people yeah. that were really highly paid and ran things were the technicians. Mm. The people on the floor, they were we had, there was tremendous overcrewing at that time. Mm. Far too many, especially in commercial television. Mm. There were far too many people on the floor. Completely oh, unnecessary. Laura, I haven't introduced you to. Uh, and of course, as the, the last time uh, technology got. Mm -hmm. La uh, more sophisticated, 
fewer and fewer people were lead, He's dead. Uh, needed, and the unions lost the their grip. There was a, when, when this kind of thing was going on, the unions ran everything, the technical unions mm. were in their, in their, in their grasp, yes, totally. Yes. So, and you had to be very careful that you didn't upset them. Oh yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we saw your uh, your your death scene just a, a few moments ago. Have you had a, a few good deaths uh, in, in your career? I, I imagine. Too well guarded. Well, we uh, never get him out of there. I can't actually. Ah, but Professor Mason is being guarded. Trying to think. I mean, it doesn't immediately occur, occur to me that mm. I did a lot of dying on television. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, uh, no, I can't remember. Uh, mm. Somebody may may dig something up and say, "Yeah, you got killed in that." But I mean, I I played a baddie in, um, but a, a baddie lead in in Free Wheelers for ten for uh, Southern Television, mm. and the we were constantly pursuing two young people who were meant to be sort of, um, you know, in their sixteen and seventeen, sort of, obviously played by slightly older actors, but. Mm. <laughs> I mean, they were constantly trying to destroy the baddies. There were two of us. Neil McCarthy was the other one. Mm. Um, I was the smart baddie. He was the thick baddie. And, um, but uh, they were constantly trying to kill us, but with, they never managed it, so mm. far as I remember. Yeah, I, I think um, TV perhaps changed a little bit in the 70s in respect that one difference between the original Avengers and the new Avengers is I think the new Avengers in terms of violence and deaths there's always people dying in the old avengers but i think it's a bit more uh realistic in this a bit like the professionals it's more it's obviously the and of course the new the new avengers was made by the same people who did the professionals so there is a sort of stylistic tone that that's that that runs that runs through them um so, so something like the new avengers how do you consider that as part of your career is it, is it a nice credit to have on on your CV, do you think, in terms of, uh, of those sort of things? Well, um, it, it, I don't ever remember using it at all. It's not, not something that had a cachet or... or Absolutely you know. not at all, because once yeah. I got into comedy, hmm. because, I mean, I obviously did other things, and I was, work, I was directing in the theatre and writing stuff, but once I became known and stopped in the street mm. for being funny. Yeah. Um, you, it was just, nobody mentioned it. It just didn't arise. Mm. The only thing they said, oh, yeah, I saw you in Liver Birds. Oh, I saw you in, in uh, you know, uh, Butterflies. I saw you, you know, no mention of New Avengers, Avengers or anything. Mm. I mean, it just, it was the past. It was gone. Yeah. You know? yeah. And it's, it's, I have to say, it's people like yourself and enthusiasts and, mm. and followers and fans and people like that said, I, I, one of my favourite programmes was. Mm. Yeah. And I say, oh, yeah, remind me, you know. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, mm. that was me. Oh, well, yeah. And I, I, I've now uh, become reacquainted with something that I can't, I would not have remembered on my own at all. I knew mm. it was a credit because when I wrote my books, we decided to <laughs> include a more or less comprehensive list mm. of credits. And I, from various sources, mm. dug up all kinds of things, titles. It's not by any means everything, but a great deal of it mm. that I couldn't remember at all without just digging around and say, oh, yeah, I was in that. Oh, yeah, I was in that. Oh, yeah, I was in that. Mm. And it, in fact, it, it's an aid de memoir to myself now that the um, uh, list, the what we call it, what I did when in mm -hmm. in my second book, um, it's 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 a, it's a reminder to me because I, 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 without that I would I I couldn't possibly remember. I have I've kept a record of all kinds of things which I thought might be interesting uh, in for posterity. Mm. And possibly for my daughter, mm. who arrived very late, but uh, it's they, they don't hang around in my head at all, you know. Yeah. And I have to say, it's it's enthusiasts like yourself <laughs> that remind me of these things. Mm. Uh, do you keep things like your scripts and little mementos and things? 
the one thing I have absolutely tried to keep is every single script that I've ever been in. Right. Because I think that's interesting because the, the style of writing changes. And I think those things get thrown away. And probably. And yeah. I think the there might be an archive, you know, at one point I was in touch with the VA. But I think the scripts could be rather valuable. I, I, I've I looked again, and um, I obviously didn't quite manage to hang on everything uh, to everything, including uh, I haven't got all the, the commercials and scripts by mm. any means. Mm. But I have got, I think, all the scripts of anything major and everything reasonably significant mm. uh, available. And at some point, I must uh, order them, <laughs> yes. put them in order, and say to because uh, somebody got in touch with me uh, via the website about a show called Wormwood. Hmm. Did you ever come across that? Uh, I don't think I did. No. Yeah, well, there you are. That's another thing. It goes back quite a long way. And there was a uh, as an actor called Hugh Burden. Right. He was quite yes. significant in his day, hmm. who starred in it. Yeah. Now, I knew I was in it because I saw the script the other day. So I knew I'd been in it. I remember the title. I knew the director for good reasons. Hmm. But I can't remember a thing about being in it. Hmm. So I'd have to look at the script. She, 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 this person wanted me to say, what was my experience of being in it? I said, I can't remember. I'd have to go. I'd have to find the script and see if it prompted some memory, you know. Hmm. Yeah, I think the scripts are very fascinating from a, you know, obviously I'm very interested in, in film history and it's always interesting to see what's in the script that's not on the screen and how things evolve, character names, etc. So, so you know, things, if you have the same to new venues and things, you know, those kind of things. Um, well, I think I've got all the scripts. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of the things people either discard or they get easily get lost or well, water damaged. Or so, so well done for uh, preserving them. Yeah. But, um, um, I, I wanted to just we did sort of allude to how TV has changed um, in terms of pay, but I was wondering how making TVs change a little bit. You mentioned obviously crew numbers and things, but was it significantly different from say working on? The videotape days, say at the BBC, and then obviously on 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 a film. And was there benefits to doing, you know, either? Well, the most noticeable thing was if you were in a television standard television studio, either at Lime Grove or Television Centre, was just the amount of heavy equipment. Mm. You know, there were cameras on dollies, and you know, and rehearsals i mean i remember uh, i was in a there was a, a top director called alan cook i don't know if you know who i mean he was absolutely top director at the bbc mm. did almost all the big stuff <laughs> and he got the biggest studio in europe which was then a television center mm -hmm. bbc and he did he decided to do, I mean, he got the, the okay to do a production of Romeo and Juliet. And characteristically, people with huge ideas, mm. he, he more or less built the city of Verona in that studio, including tiny alleys mm. that, you know, echoed the real tiny alleys in yes. medieval Verona. Mm to the point where the cameras couldn't get down them. <laughs> and we were shooting later and later. It was getting, you know, the, you know uh, all kinds of well-known people in that show. Um, and uh, if you research it, you'll see. Hmm. <laughs> and I remember, you know, one camera coming up a narrow alley and somebody obviously acting at the cross crossing of two narrow alleys and meeting somebody and having and another camera coming up and then of course the next thing is one camera gets the other camera in shot and <laughs> of course and they couldn't and they because of the narrowness they couldn't get out of each other's way 
Mm. And, you know, we went on, we shot till after midnight or one night, everybody going, getting extremely angry mm. and getting extremely angry with the director. <laughs> so that's the sort of thing that was happening in the good old days, you know. Mm. I mean, at least, it, you know, it wasn't, a, it got beyond, you know, a static camera and, you know, all, all in, a, in a line on a stage. And mm. D.W. Griffiths and all that, but it got beyond that. But I mean, so there was some complexity in, in the shooting and the and the different shots. In fact, it was the ambition. Alan Cook was incredibly ambitious and trying things all the time. And of course, um, it, it, it became a nightmare because he overreached himself. Mm. And uh, nowadays, of course, what is noticeable is how much lighter the cameras are and also mm. that people will start to shoot so that they they'll say uh, we'll take a whole sequence just on one on on and one angle we'll shoot it again on another angle and leave it to us we'll edit it together you know yeah so so instead of doing because it was halfway what was i'm talking about uh, in terms of alan cook and romeo and juliet it was halfway to being possible to be a live show mm. you know at a pinch if they really, you know, a little stage before that, they would have done the same kind of routine, but it would have gone out live. I mean, I started doing in live television. Yeah, I did a whole series of um, the life of Jesus Christ, you know, mm. live at six in the evening mm. uh, with with film inserts. And yeah. of course, they had to be very careful. Cameras had to be very careful to try and keep each other out of shot, and especially booms. Booms were the thing that kept coming into the shop. And of course, they were, you know, sort of screaming and hair tearing over that. Mm. But uh, so it's just got lighter and lighter and lighter and more flexible and more flexible. Mm. I don't, I haven't been in a regular television studio now for years. So mm. I don't know what they get up to. Yeah. I don't know how minor or, or miniaturized the equipment is. I actually don't. I'm sure if you wanted, you you you'd be able to get an invitation to to watch something something being recorded if you're interested. Oh yeah, yeah. There's always lots of shows at um, Palmer Studios in particular. You can sort of see see recordings. I've been I've been around some some sets as well and sort of seen you know, the magic behind behind it or how it's sort sort of done. And I think it's all very much sort of single camera stuff these days, rather That's than right. the vision mixing. You had a multiple Absolutely. camera. Absolutely. That. That's right. And they and they, they just shoot quickly because they they <clears throat> they don't need to run out of film, mm. <laughs> you yes. know it's all digital, and mm. so they can shoot as much as they like. And they can just change the angle, shoot again, shoot again, and in the, as long as the show is properly in their heads, in the director's mm. head, and his supporters, it'll all cut together. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's it's hugely different and much cheaper, of course. Oh yeah, yeah, I think so, and and I think also rehearsal time has been something that a lot of actors say. Well, they liked it in the old days because you had a, you know a few days to rehearse, and then maybe then you do it as as a live performance. And part of some of the complexities of working out the characters and your relationships with other actors, you lose because you might not see them until you're on on the first day of shooting, which must be a bit discon disconcerting. Well, it, it's got a little bit more like filming. Mm. Well, you don't meet anybody till the day you do it, unless you're a star and you're you're working on the whole film, of course. Mm. But if you're a, a you know a, a supporting player, you you just arrive on the set on the day. Mm. Of, they'll usually run the lines a couple of times, and then that's it. Yeah, and and that and so you adapt to that, and you just. Mm. I mean, that's where casting comes in, of course. That's why they don't. <laughs> take too many chances except possibly for the, for a lead when, when you prepare for months or weeks and at least mm. and you can take chances and say well you know can you I would like you to play more like this and you know uh, get people to do different things from what they perhaps ordinarily would do if they just arrived on the set on the day mm. but on the uh, that's why you're 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 cast for as you're no, to, uh, because you're known for doing that sort of thing uh, competently yeah yeah 
And, and I think even sort of um, theatre rehearsal times, I think there's really been cut a lot from what I understand as, uh, as well. From, from talking to some actors, you really, yeah, you used to get so X number of weeks and now it's, you know, considerably shorter, which must be more problematic than if you're filming a, a film, because of course it's short, stop, start, you know, all that sort of thing. So it's, um, have you noticed theatre change a lot in in your in your career? Well, you see, I haven't been I, <clears throat> I haven't been in a stage show myself hmm. since I can't remember when. Yeah, <clears throat> that's a long time ago. But I directed in theatre, but of course I I could set my own rules then. Hmm. Uh, it's a little while back, but nevertheless, I never uh, rehearsed a full length play in under four weeks. So that was that, but that was at my expense and so on and so on. Um, <clears throat> I haven't talked to a theatre actor these days, so I actually, it's very interesting what you're, I can well imagine that it's happened. Mm. And um, that they, but it's, I, it, the, the, the reason behind it is almost certainly money. Yeah. It's yeah. just, it, it's, the theatre is being squeezed, I think, what with COVID, and the general uh, economic climate, I think people are just, so they need to just cut down. Hmm. Uh, uh, and so presumably people have to, I, I if, uh, yeah, it's very interesting. I might pursue that and see if I can find somebody. <laughs> I mean, I go, there's a th- local theatre called the Orange Tree, which we go to quite a lot, hmm. uh, which is, uh, you know, I'd be quite curious to know how long they rehearse because that they usually those shows, which are on the whole very good, um, seem to be rehearsed for the usual amount of time. Which I mean, th- for a a decent standard of show, it, it would be four. The minimum would be four weeks. After mm. that, you. I mean, obviously, repertory used to be much shorter, but yeah. you, but that showed on stage. I mean, I write about that. I mean the. I did a bit of repertory, or quite a bit of repertory, but even some weekly repertory. And, it, and to me, the standard of show on stage was disgraceful. I mean, a lot of people just, uh, what they call wing it, they improvised half their script. They got mm. the gist of it. And then, you know, in fact, a friend of mine who worked in that weekly rep field briefly, she, her, the leading actor of the day says, <clears throat> he came up to her and said, no cues given or expected. <laughs> so he, 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 if you looked at the text and expected to learn your cues, forget it. He was just going to tell the story as he remembered it on the night, and you'd have to judge when he'd stopped. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. And that's, to me, mm. uh, very rough stuff. Mm. Yes. Yeah, uh, if there's too much of that, you won't survive. And mm. that's, I think, is that's the sort of thing that eventually killed repertory theatre. It just wasn't worth the money because yeah. you don't get that kind of uh, tattiness on television. At least it's professionally presented. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But it wasn't in a lot of theatres then. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting how theatre has, has changed. I mean, you, you say about the economic pinch. I About sort of seven years ago, I would go to the West End maybe I see maybe 10 shows in a year and that would be staying there for a few days and seeing a couple at a time and it was I live in Devon so it's quite a you know uh, quite involved to do it and now one or two if I'm lucky it's just that the, the theatre shows are far more expensive you know tripled in in just my sort of Absolutely. theatre going life you know but, um, well they did I think yeah, they're desperately trying to stay alive, I think, is, is my uh, construction of it. Hmm. I mean, they really, you know. And, of course, I've, I'm sure you've noticed, almost everybody is doing musicals. Even the young Vic, you know, they did Oklahoma. I mean, yes, I mean, is, I've, I've heard good things about it, and I've seen... No, I gather it's very good, but I didn't... Yeah, but it's not something you associate with. Well, it's not my thing. And also the old, the young Vic the old was Vic, kind yeah. of avant-garde. Yeah. You know, mm. well, you, you can't mm. get more aria guard than Oklahoma, really. Yes, right. Yeah, yeah, it is certainly, certainly shifting. 
Um, I just wanted to, to, to focus on some of your, your a few TV credits. Um, I was thinking that was the week that wa uh, was your very famous monologue on the uh, um, consumer guide to, to religion. I just wanted to sort of, uh, where did that idea for that come about and what was it like and, you know, and how does it sort of sit in your, in your career? Okay. Um, I'm now going to undermine my, the story in my book, but I, I will briefly tell you what happened. Okay. I had a colleague, a, young, a younger colleague in the trade who was very cheeky and he tried to get into, that was the week that was, as an actor. Ned Sherin said to him, uh, we're, we're fully cast, but we need scripts. And this is an idea I'd like somebody to write. Hmm. And... It was, uh, according to my information, it was Ned's idea, right. which was to do the equivalent of a which report mm. on religions. Yeah. This man, Charles, rang me up and said, uh, told me this story, and he said, They've, I've got this um, possible brief to... I said, what a marvellous idea. Mm. And he said, oh, well, perhaps we could work on it together. So we got together and we pooled our knowledge. He's, he's Jewish. And so we pooled our knowledge of, you know, a sort of semi-joke knowledge of religions. I added communism because, I, to me, it's essentially a kind of, um, you know, uh, non-supernatural religion. Mm. And um, we, we, we started writing on it. He, he went away and started doing stuff. <clears throat> and it turned out that he has been a, tried to write all, all his life off and on and not been very successful. Mm. And uh, what his version was turning into was a satire of a witch magazine. I said, that's not what we've been asked to do. Hmm. We've been asked to do a satire on religion. Yeah. I said, oh, yeah. So I said, I'll tell you what. You do your version. I'll do mine. So I, I still have the kitchen table on which I started writing about nine in the evening, and hmm. I finished it about four in the morning, writing the, that was the week that was, Consumer Guide to the Religion. Mm. And, of course, he had contributed some ideas, so we were joint credited, but that is actually my version. And it was absolutely wonderful to write. Yeah. Because I have a very beady-eyed approach to religion myself. I don't know what your position is. Um, yeah, I'm not religious. It would right. be nice. It'd be nice to be. I think we'd all like to be religious. Oh, well, I wouldn't. I'm, del I'm extremely um, relieved that I'm not, um, because I think it's one of the most destructive forces forces on the planet. It can be. Uh, can. Uh, people kill happily in the name of some god, and so on and so on. Yeah. And assassinate whole generations of you know. Uh, genocide is about a lot about re religious enthusiasm a lot of the time. Yeah. So, but anyway, um, it was what, of course, uh, we offered it to, to them. It was immediately, so we, this is it, wonderful. It was given to David Frost. And of course, it uh, the actual running time is about 16 minutes, but I think he does eight and a half or something like that. Yeah. Which I think is available on YouTube and so on. I, I watched it in preparation. And it's very, very, very good. Yes, time. well, the, the full version is even you know, fuller. Mm -hmm. But um, so, uh, yes, so that was, that was uh, as a result of that, mm. um, Ned s s chucked a few, uh, s some other ideas in my direction. Mm. And so I, I think I sort of, I wrote sort of about six pieces mm. in the end for them. But there was nothing, nothing to equal that. Uh, to match that at all, you know. Yeah. And I remember I was in Rep, I think, in Lincoln at the time. <laughs> so I was kind of finding moments to write things while I was trying to rehearse. Mm. 
Mm. Something, that was a fortnightly rep, so it was not the worst, but you know. Mm. So yeah, that, that was it. I I I'm very pleased with that. And I it yeah. said what I wanted to say about religion. So yeah. Well, was the full version ever recorded in any no, 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 it wouldn't no. be, but you know, I've got it. So mm. if if you actually will wanted to read it, I'm got it. I would be delighted to, yes. Yeah, it sounds very oh, good. Oh right, well, yeah. I'll I'll make a note. Oh, thank to, you. To try and dig it out. Oh yeah, yeah, that that'd be lovely. I mean, were you? I, I suppose you knew it would kind of would have a, a, a big. It would be controversial, and you kind of expected there would be some complaints and you know things. Uh, uh, well, personally, well, yeah. and certainly Charles, Charles, in that sense, we're in the same on the same page. We yeah. hoped it would. You know? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Both, both, both of us. You know, and he he talked about uh, the um, obl obligatory um, uh, observances that Jews have to go through if you're if you're uh, Orthodox. You know, if you're you know, uh, uh, yes, you know, extraordinary about not using the same dish for the. You know what I mean? You can't. Mm. It, it's very strict. Yeah. And I mean, to to somebody from outside, imposing that kind of discipline on yourself when you're cooking, you know, it's kind of, kind of nutty. It's completely insane. So, yeah. Yeah. so from our point of view, it's just hilarious. I mean, as I say, he's not he's not a practice. He's not a religious practicing Jew. He's mm -hmm. he's just all his background is Jewish. Hmm. Um, just a couple of other things to to to, to ask you about. Um, I want to ask you about Force Ten from from Navarron. Um, of Harrison Ford, uh, Robert Shaw, Edward Fox. Was it nice to be involved in a in a film of that of that scale? Uh, I see. I we was sure, what, what, it was, I seem to remember being on the Isle of Jersey. Was that right? Jersey or Guernsey? It, was well, well, have, well have been. I'd have to double check. I think right? it was Jersey. Yeah. Um, I just remember. I it, <clears throat> these days. They try, and especially if you're on a, on a Hammer film, hmm. there is no uh, spare time. Everybody uses every minute. Hmm. You know, it's, it's like it's like a, a well-run, properly run factory. But on many films in the old days, you used to be called for safety and then did nothing. And one of the things I remember being on, on Jersey was that I wasn't called and I wasn't called and I wasn't mm. called. So I used to go for long walks and Jersey's an odd place because um, where the river valleys are, it's rather beautiful and wooded and blah, blah, blah. But everything in between is market gar gardening. Mm. So there's endless roads of beetroot, carrots, cabbages. So it's extremely mm. boring landscape. <laughs> I'm waiting for this, and um, St. Helier is not that interesting. Finally, I get called, mm. and uh, of course, I was working with uh, Robert Shaw, wasn't I? Mm. Yeah. yeah. You've seen the clip? Uh, yeah, yes, I have, yes. Yeah. And the main thing that about that is that it was kind of sad, because I don't know if you know, Robert was an alcoholic. Yes, yeah. And so, because he was such a good actor, of course, he was a very good writer as well, but he was a very good actor, he was still getting work. But the thing about the takes were everybody holding their breath, hoping that with a following win, this one, he'd get through and be good. Mm. And so half, we did quite a few takes, and half of them had to be jumped because he fluffed or and and I I was on it very briefly and that was the end. Once I'd done that, that was it, that was the end of me. Mm. But uh I noticed that uh there was that tension in the crew and the other actors and so on. Mm. I'm very sympathetic to him, yeah, but uh willing him to get it right, you know. Yes. So that's the thing I remember. I don't know how long after that he, because he died early, didn't he? 
he, he did yes and yeah very very suddenly um it can't be been that much of a of a gap between the two yeah. i wouldn't i wouldn't have thought but um... so that's my memory of that that mm. event i i didn't see the film at the time as i normally don't mm. i mean because they they're not normally things i rush to see or whatever but i did see it comparatively recently oh right it's a, it's a major major uh epic isn't it i mean it's, Oh, yes, it's a big scale, isn't it? Huge scale, I hadn't realised. I can't even remember where I am in it. Uh, am I still in it? Um, uh, well, it, it has been a, a while since, I, since I've seen it, so I'd have to... Um, well, well you know, I'm just curious, vaguely, because I, I can't even remember myself in it, seeing it. Hmm. But, but um, I'm just having a look. Robert Shaw died in 1978. He was only 51. Yes. Uh, and... And uh, t- uh, he-, he died the same years as the film came out, seventy eight. Oh, yeah. So yeah. So you can see how, uh, what why he would have been so rocky. Hmm. So that that's my memory of that. There's, is this poor guy? Yeah. Just about holding on. Hmm. But he seemed perfectly pleasant from your point of view. He oh, was, he, was a, he was a nice. Well, I, you know, there are two kinds of drunks. You know, the ones that get angry when they get drunk. And start mm. to want to hit you, yeah. And the ones that just become dreamily pleasant and beam and sun and sunny, and I think even more like that. Oh, oh, good, good. Um, and, and another interesting film uh, with Peter Sellers, The Prisoner of Zelda. Did was, was that um, memorable at all? <clears throat> no, I have to. I did. I have seen the clip. Yeah, and uh, that's what reminds me again that I was in. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I, I just remember that Peter Sellers was amazingly undemonstrative. Mm. Uh, you know, um, if you work with Spike Milligan, which I did at the, at the Mermaid, yeah, he he never stopped performing. Mm. He, there were jokes here, you know, comments here. He was bubbling all the time. It was kind of constant stream of nervous energy and i remember thinking because i mean you know when you watch peter sellers in his major especially when he's at his best in his comic roles the invention is absolutely fantastic all Mm. bubbles out of him but on this particular movie and the bit i was on he was just very very quiet and very very he was subdued very well behaved you know just trying to get it right and I, as far as I know, it, I don't know. Usually, you, you do a retake or two because one thing or another. But I don't remember any dramas of any kind. Just watching this, I mean, I admired him enormously as an extremely creative performer, mm. you know. But this was a very uh, modest, and, and it, it wasn't. It's not the greatest film in the world, is it? From what I remember. Unfortunately, not there. <laughs> um, and I think he did a lot of rubbish, actually, which is a sad thing. He he put his name to a lot of stuff, mm. which was a pity for somebody as fantastically talented as he was. Well, I think as you alluded to in the last conversation, was that you kind of as an actor, you you take what comes your way, and it's in it you you're you're even as a star, I suppose you can only do what the scripts that are in front of you. Oh, I, I guess. But. I think in his case, from other things I've heard, is that he he got to be in his bonnet and wanted to pursue some idea, and mainstream companies didn't want to take it up. So he found somebody to do it hmm. against everybody's better judgment. Yeah. Uh, in his case, not hmm. because he he could have just stood out and waited for the really quality work but he he himself wanted to do stuff which people said i'm not sure this is the best the best thing you could be doing and he, and yeah. they were right and he was wrong in oh, his yeah, case. Um, yeah i think that being there and whether he did films like prisoner of zelda to help get at that point zender together. by the way oh Zen, i i i do apologize um so so um maybe some of it was sort of trying to sort of get to where he wanted to. Work. Oh, yes, and, I'm, and, and working with the star and so Oh, yeah, I mean, that would have been a perfectly good film to, 
to, to, to make, you know. Mm. Uh, he'd have been paid a lot of money and, you know, used yes. his talents, you know. But he had, obviously, as a member of the goons, he was, he had very quirky ideas. Mm. And when they worked, they were wonderful, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, in Dr. Strangelove, he is absolutely beyond belief magnificent and playing yes. both those two parts. I mean, it's yeah. just yeah. The, the versatility yeah. of the man is just extraordinary. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, that's a, a you know, I think one of his one of his best films and, and and being there so different to his other comedy, well, it's not really a comedy, it's 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 a, a fabulous film. Um of course you did appear in to Cluzo, which was noticeably not Peter Sellers, it was Zionari, so that nicely takes us on to on onto that. I mean, and that has a um a reputation as being a very um troubled production. Do, do you remember that that film? I was never involved in the trouble side yeah. of it. Oh good. good. What was hilarious about that hmm. was again I write about this. <clears throat> Is it was that this was another one of those occasions when I was flown to Zurich mm. and not called onto the set. Mm. And there's another actor in it called George Pravda, mm. very well known. And we got chatting. He was a lovely guy. And day after day, we weren't called. Mm. So we said, let's go out for a walk. So we walked around Zurich. And he told jokes mm. for several hours at a time. I have never met anybody who knew that many jokes. And he said, have you heard this one? Have you heard this one? And I said, I'm sorry, I can't match what you know, because I don't tell jokes. I, I can, I remember very few jokes. I said, I can be funny, but I don't remember. I can't, tell, I don't tell jokes. He was a complete uh, encyclopedia of jokes. And so we would spend about three days not being called, going around Zurich with him making me laugh all the time. Oh, wonderful. And, uh, and having meals, of course, and having coffees. Yeah. So that's what I remember about that film. And I don't remember shooting what I shot at all. I know mm. it was in it. Mm. And I know uh, I have a... F- sense of what Alan Arkin was like, a sort of gentle, floaty kind of person. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised that it was troubled, but I, I don't know what the trouble was. You know, I wasn't involved. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of it was was the script didn't work, the direction. And I think Alan Arkin, who, who is a, obviously a great comedic actor and, and you know, uh, can t- turn, his, uh, turn his head to comedy quite easily. He, he felt very lost in it. I, I think he's... He said so, um, but I, I, but it is. I suppose what you remember is you tend to remember little things like, like walking around Zurich, and it's, those those are the memories rather than necessarily the film. Well, the point is, I, I played a negligible part from what I, I, I can't. It was uh, yeah, Swiss a Swiss banker was, was that's what I mean. Yeah. I don't think one would remember expressing a, a, a couple of moments as a Swiss banker. You see, just probably not. Just say, did I get? Did we get our fee? Yes, good. Yeah. Yes, 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 absolutely. Happy to um, do it, and and the fun part yeah. was being with George. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's often the, the things you don't expect, isn't it? That that's that um, are the delights. Um, going to com- uh, t- TV comedy, um, Leonard Rossiter. You worked for a couple of times, uh, Rise and Damp, and then of course the Rise and Fall of Reginald Perrin. Um, what was Leonard Rossiter like? Well, I admire Leonard enormously. He's absolutely a superb actor and especially mm. craftsman. Uh, <clears throat> I write at some length about uh, one scene we had together, which is the um, um, the where I played the gas man when yeah. he was Rigsby, mm. uh, because it was it was a I I only had that episode with him in that show, and he ran the he ran the studio, and it was a good thing he did because he uh, devised this gag. Mm. I mean, it was in the script, but how to do it so that it worked? Because mm. it was a highly technical joke, 
of yeah. all the coins pouring down his trouser legs. Yeah. And it was entirely because of Leonard that we got it right on one take. Hmm. He ran the studio that day. And it was only because of his, of his dogged intervention and requests up to the director as to what he would like and what wouldn't it be better and wouldn't it be serious. And that's how it worked. And there's a detailed description of that in my book. I, I, have you ever read my book? And no, I'm aware of them because it's, it's two, isn't it? Two volumes. There are two. And yeah. it's in part yeah. two, which is covers situation comedy. And it's quite a, it's a, quite an extended, detailed description. Hmm. Well, I must get uh, and But the, he was a fantastic craftsman. I mean, the hmm. wonderful thing about him, but, you know, one of the things about him, when I got that script, it was, it was so thick, I thought, I didn't know that Rising Damp was an hour long. I didn't think they did sitcom episodes an hour long. Mm. And of course, <laughs> it turned out that because Leonard spoke so fast, yes, they mm. had to write extra material for him. Mm. And he probably spoke faster than anybody else in the business. And then uh, Richard Blowers was the only person that came anywhere near him. Right. The rapidi rapidity of delivery. Mm. <clears throat> but um, I, I loved working with him. And I think he enjoyed because they, I realised that the scene in... Um, Reggie Perrin is almost the same scene. It's, it's, it's completely similar. different writers. In mm. each case, it's somebody wanting to give up his career. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Saying, I, the, I, this is a terrible life, I must change it. Although, mm. of course, the gas man uh, reverts because of the... Mm. So, yeah, I, 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 I've always admired Leonard. And there's another story about him in the book because... Um, um, there was a very fascinating play on in Belgrade, the Belgrade Theatre called Semi-Detached, which came into town. And Leonard should have played the lead in, in town, and he would, he would have been brilliant. And um, Laurence Olivier decided to play it. And oh, well. uncharacteristically funny. kept drying. Oh. I saw him. Yeah. He wasn't good, and he knew he wasn't good. Yeah. And he, he was, it was, it was, again, in terms of history, that's a very interesting time. The management didn't dare risk bringing Leonard into town to play a lead, although he'd been he'd absolutely sold out in, in Coventry. Mm. So uh, that's changed now, of course. Why wouldn't he be allowed in, in the West? He End? wasn't a star. Oh, obviously, yes, I suppose he wasn't. And suppose by he wasn't, he he wasn't was, in the yeah. same league as Laurence Olivier oh, as no, a star. No, no, but his performance would have brought them in. And I suppose also maybe there's a slight slight snobbery of or he's TV perhaps, and because TV. Is, I don't know. Did they, know, they, was he already in TV then? Well, well I mean, well, what what year was the? Uh, I can't play? remember. Um, You'd have to look it up. Rising Damp was seventy five, so he did sort of get big quite yeah. late in his, so what his time, career. What, when was Semi Detached in London? I don't know. Oh, I'd have, I'd have to, to check. But as you say, yeah, maybe he hadn't quite. Maybe he hadn't quite got it, there. Got there. Yeah. I think yeah. if he'd been a TV star, they'd have taken him. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, one of the show I wanted to mention was uh, up Pompeii. It seems that seemed like quite a fun. You know, all the I think the play Santa Mucus in in that, and there's somebody um, Jeremy Young plays and lovely whimsical names in in that one. Well, um, Frankie Howard has been, and in principle, is probably my favourite comic. Hmm. The only thing I was always sad about was that he never, or very rarely, got the material he deserved. He kept regurgitating the same material. And although he was extremely endearing and funny mm. in the way, and I don't know whether that was because he rejected stuff that was written for him or he couldn't find the right writer. Mm. There was a moment when he was on, the, that was the week that was, when he was doing original stuff. Mm. 
which was extremely funny and worth looking at again if you can. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I loved working with him. And again, there's a story in my book. Mm, yes. <laughs> about yeah. a build to one of his laughs. Ah, right. And there were four of us building. Each had a line. And then Frankie had the payoff, of mm. course. <laughs> and there was one actor who wouldn't just play the game of feeding the star, which is what you do if you've got lines that come up to a laugh line. So that was interesting mm. because Frankie... You could see the trouble across these eyes, but he didn't get angry. He tried to explain to this actor why he shouldn't, what it, I would describe as decorate the line. And so that was an interesting hmm. uh, reinforcement of a lesson that I already knew. Yes. But it was interesting to see that they'd got two actors that understood what, <laughs> two, three actors that understood what their job was in this context. Mm. And they got an actor in that particular small part <laughs> that didn't understand what his role was, didn't know how to play. So that mm. was very interesting. But mm. interesting that Frankie didn't get angry. And again, I don't think any of the scripts were very great, but his charm and his, and his yeah, wonderful delivery, I love that particular delivery, I, one of my favourite people. And one other fascinating thing about that, though, is it was a David Croft show, and he, there was an excuse to constantly have about something like seven or eight extremely beautiful young women mm. on the show doing nothing at all. And everybody wondered what they were there, because Frankie wasn't interested in beautiful young women. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so I think they were for David. Right, yes. David, like, and, and they kept popping up as far as I can. <laughs> but they were extraordinary. I, I, have, not, I have not seen uh, a collection of extraordinarily ravishing young females all together at one time, ever, before or since. Yeah, yeah. So that, that was another memorable thing. <laughs> well, that's yes, that a good one, yeah. And again, you wouldn't have that now, so you, it, it wouldn't. It, it well, wouldn't. I don't think you'd have them like sort of like some sort of support team. I don't think so. No, no. Let's see. Uh, sadly, not everything that changes for the better, really. But, uh, <laughs> but there we go. Um, you, you mentioned da David Croft, and of course, he did um, a, a Dad's Army, and again, that's a very heavy, heavy hitter show that you were that you were on. Um, any memories of of Dad's Army? Well, only because, uh, again, the only reason I was on that, you, I mean, I, <clears throat> I, I was, in a sense, not really on it. I was filmed in a studio, a yeah. television centre, to be slotted into it. Oh, OK. In the bay, well, you, you, do you remember what I did? I, I haven't seen it. Well, I played time. Charles Boyer, mm -hmm. who is a, a super, a French superstar. Uh, playing Napoleon. Hmm. So it was a set twice removed. So they wanted somebody for, wanted somebody from Napoleon, but yeah. they wanted a clip of the the film Napoleon. Hmm. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> they asked for the clip, they asked Hollywood for the clip, and they would have had uh, to sell the studio to get it. I mean, you know, it's, it's, I don't know, it's about 40 seconds or something. Yeah. It's a tiny clip, hmm. but they wanted the earth for it. Yeah. So Dave, at that time, David had got the feeling that I did weird, I could do all kinds of odd things. Hmm. The first thing I ever played for him was with a French accent. Right. So he just got me into the studio, dressed me up as Napoleon, Oh, well, Charles Barrier in the movie Being Napoleon hmm. and just filmed me and slotted it in. So it was, uh, you know, kind of two hours' work. Hmm. 
yes yeah, interesting how the these roles come about isn't it sort of well, that was my uh, uh contribution to dad's army oh what wonderful um he, um it just reminded me uh, that that you were answer i i believe and then your parents came over later on is, is that is that no 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 i was born in france no, no. sorry yeah, born in france. Uh, you were born, yeah, born in france but then you no, yeah well my yeah. we we my family my mother father myself and then my well i had a sister who died eventually but my other brother hmm. we were all born in france but then right. the war came yeah because my father was a canadian <laughs> very late in the day again i describe this in the book this mm -hmm. is book one <clears throat> we we escaped we yeah. got out we got out as the germans were coming over the border <clears throat> in in uh, june uh, uh 1939 yeah yes was it, or was it for, for no in june 1940 it would have been yeah there. yeah yeah, and um, uh, I mean, were your parents very supportive when you went into acting? Was this was uh, my my father, my ma mother was a was a Hungarian woman, and uh, mm. she was in, oh, absolutely embedded in the arts in her head. I mean, the artists in the family and all, and the pianists, whatever. And so she was tremendously supportive. My my father was quieter. I think he would rather have seen me get a proper job hmm. but <clears throat> he he wouldn't he wouldn't he didn't dream of getting in my way and so you know they 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 went along with it very in a very sober fashion you know there was yeah. no real resistance i i didn't have a heavy father so it didn't yeah. uh, there wasn't a problem hmm. it was just anyway it was a weird way it happened anyway so yeah 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 um, because uh, so, so, we talked a little bit about your initial acting experiences, but d why did you want to be an actor? How did you kind of fall into it? Well, again, I described this in detail in book one. Mm, yeah, uh, it essentially started at school. Mm. Um, I mean, I and even my primary school, because I, when I came over here, I couldn't speak English, mm. and I had a strong accent for many years. Yeah. <clears throat> And I remember I was in my primary school, put on the stage and asked to sing the Marseillaise in French hmm. for some reason. And then when I went to grammar school, I still had a bit of an accent. <laughs> uh, we had a new schoolmaster who came in from the war, English master, and he started to revive plays at my grammar school. Hmm. And because I sounded a bit foreign, he cast me as an Italian mm. <laughs> in a Sheridan play. Yeah. And that's how it started. So I had a small part in a school play. And the next two years, I played the leads. Mm. And there was an actor ahead of, uh, in our, my class who joined in a local uh, uh, dramatic society ahead of me. I joined him afterwards, who, who decided to become a professional actor. And so there was the example there. I joined the society. I did a lot of acting for them. And I got sick of writing exams. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was sort of, I had an equal choice as to whether go, to go on what they called the art side or the science side. Yeah, And everybody at school told me, well, the starting money on the science side is more. Hmm. There was no other reason given, no uh, uh, indication of, there was no uh, uh, information about what you might do after school. None at all. It was virtually hmm. nothing. Work in an office, uh, you know, teach. No, it was absolutely disastrous. And... So by going on, the, the idea would then be, but they said, you, you get your starting money on the science side will be more than on the art side. That's all they could tell me. Yeah. So I was being groomed to go into university 
in science. Hmm. And in fact, I got a, an entrance to Manchester University, but I didn't take it. Uh, so I, I, I must mention uh, Polish, one of my favourite TV series, and what it was like perhaps working with, uh, with Ronnie Barker. Well, uh, again, I first worked with Ronnie. Ron, Ron, Ronnie, Ronnie Barker was a superb actor. Hmm. If he hadn't gone the way he did, he would be playing the major classics of the National Theatre at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Mm. <clears throat> he was quite wonderful actor. Mm. And again, in schools television, uh, this man, Ronald Eyre, found him. And he was in quite a lot of schools TV shows. And Ronald Eyre wrote a play of his own, which he directed for television and filming. And uh, he's, I, I was in it, but he starred. Uh, what, Ronnie, Ronnie Barker? Ronnie Barker. Yeah, yeah, just, sorry. Yeah. I just lost his name for oh, a moment. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> that's okay. um, Ron, Ronnie, uh, so, so Ronnie mm. was being uh, the lead in yeah. major TV shows. Mm. Uh, you know, straight, I mean, uh, you know, the there was a, 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 um, often a comic element, but they were not comedies. They were, they were just the lead. So that's mm. how I knew him quite well, uh, doing that stuff. Mm. And then he, we lost touch completely. And I don't know quite how he ended up in comedy, but obviously somebody realized he was funny. And what I didn't know is that he wrote a lot of the material. Did you know that? I, I, I did, yes, yes. Because he, I gather he wrote it under another name. Is that right? Yes, I can't remember what, what it was. But I never knew what it was. Yeah, um, it's on top of my tip of my tongue. I'll, I'll, I'll think about that. But yes, he did write a lot of his. But he, but I think what it was, we didn't want um, people to, you know, if he, if he said yeah. it as, as Ronnie Barker, they wouldn't want people to think, well, we've got to have it in because it's Ronnie's work. Yes, so I think yes, that, that's, exactly. that's um, why he did it. Well, I didn't know he wrote it all. So presumably he wrote comedy scripts. He didn't write plays, presumably. He, yeah, he he, he um, wrote a lot for um, the, the the two Ronnies under that particular oh, yes, uh, yes, yes. A pseudonym. Yeah. <clears throat> oh right. Well, so he was a. He, so that's my uh, response to to Ronnie. He, oh. And as far as I know, he never changed. He was always. I remember when we were on the Ronald Lair's show, we found that. Uh, we both uh, discovered that we both collected stamps, uh, but mm. he also collected match boxes. I think. Right. But by then he had somebody arrange his stamps for him, so he had enough money to to get somebody to lay, lay them all out for him. Yeah. So um, anyway, he was a, he was an absolutely lovely man. Uh, so I, I'm, that's all I can. Remark oh. about it. Uh, uh, the um, the guy who played the uh, prison 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 officer there. Yes. Um, uh, well, Mister. Um, That's uh, right. Um, yeah, yeah. With Brian Wild as Mister Barrowcloth and uh, Fulton McKay as Mister. Uh, sorry, Fulton McKay. Fulton McKay. Yes. Well, <clears throat> Fulton. I Fulton. I was in. Um, Glasgow Citizens Rep when Fulton Mackay was there and oh. so it was Annette Crosby do you know who I mean by Annette Crosby? I, I do indeed, yeah Well we were all there together for a season for a man called Peter Dugid and um, so that's so I knew F Fulton before but I only did one episode of Porridge as you know hmm. and I played this vicar yeah. And uh, <clears throat> it was lovely to be on, you know, as usual, but it was just a quick in and out. You know, again, because it was a disciplined show, you just rehearse mornings and everybody says, hello, hello, hello. You do the show and you go away. Hmm. You know, uh, I didn't socialise with anybody on that show. 
uh, any more than I did with most shows, you know. So, but it was um, it was a good script, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. I want to say Gerald Wiley was was the pseudonym he did, but it was Wiley, oh, really? something Wiley, but I can't remember what the the first name was. I never knew. I never knew that. I didn't even know he wrote. Yeah, I mean, if you look at some of his monologues in it, two one I mean, it's remarkable. That, you know, as you said about being a great actor, you've got to be a great actor to be able to do that yeah. that, that kind of kind oh, of stuff. Yeah. He was he was extraordinary. Hmm. He's really talented. <clears throat> Because I think also weren't you in? Uh, was it the the national or the RSC with Richard Burton and people like like that? Well, my very first job hmm. was at the Old Vic, no, no, not the RSC. I didn't yeah. do the RSC till nineteen ninety four. Ah, oh, right. Uh, I never got into the RSC, hmm. but my first job out of RADA was at the Old Vic Theatre. Yeah, and uh, the the company was headed by. Richard Burton, Claire Bloom, Faye Compton, and in the end it was um, uh, Michael Horden. Hmm. And uh, Michael Horden was one of the finest actors I've ever worked with. Yeah. Uh, Richard Burton was a character. Hmm. Again, I write about him in the book. Yeah. uh, Because I think there's a lot to say about him. Oh, absolutely. He never became what he could have been, but he keep. I suppose you could say he became more and more himself. Mm. <laughs> yes, and uh, I think died young because of his personal habits. Mm. He drank far too much. Uh, he was a very strange mix because, <clears throat> as I point out, it was. In society, it was still the age of deference. Mm. And if you if you're at the bottom of the company, as I was, uh, you were you were treated as uh, uh, just one notch above a slave. <laughs> uh, and you were just a, a hired thing. Mm. And um, but and at the top of the, the only first name uh, exchanges happened at the top of the company between the director and mm. the stars. Yeah. Everybody else was on uh, second name terms. Mm. Uh, but the boss was not, uh, he, he got an amazing opportunity. He was, he was being, uh, he was thought to be one of the great up and coming directors, but he didn't quite make it in the commercial field. And mm. so he picked, he grabbed this opportunity to do Shakespeare for, I think, in the end, it was seven years. Mm. You go through the, the entire canon. Uh, <clears throat> but so it was, would have all been very, very stuffy yeah. if it hadn't been for Richard Burton. Yes. Yeah, because Burton, of course, started breaking every rule in the book. Hmm. I mean, he was on first name terms with everybody. Yeah, and so he, he you, you could feel a slight sh- tremor and shock going through some people, mm-hmm. but he wouldn't have wouldn't have dreamt for in, in one second occurred mm-hmm. to Richard to, to do anything else. Yeah, you yeah. know. So and of course he was late. He was mm. whatever. There was, I remember there was one, one rehearsal. I think it was when George Devine was directed. No, 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 it was, it was, it was, not, yeah. When he, he didn't arrive for, we, the whole company was waiting for about an hour and a half, an hour and a half in the morning. Of course, no, no mobile phone, <laughs> no idea, hmm. nothing. He didn't get it, pick up a telephone. And finally, it turned out. And it's quite a nice story. He got into an altercation with a taxi driver. Of course, yeah. And they ended up in a local court, <laughs> at the local police station. Yeah. So that's another story. And that's in the book. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so um, <laughs> that's what Richard was like. Yeah. You know, uh, he was just his own. He, he, he just worked according to his own rules. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, and Claire, Claire was a, given her age, she wasn't an absolute baby, but she, as a theater, in terms of theater experience, she was a baby. Mm. So she was incredibly innocent. Yeah. And she'd start, uh, Charlie Chaplin had starred her recently in um, Limelight. Oh, yes. And so she came with that glow all around her. Mm. <clears throat> but she was not, uh, at that stage, a uh, competent stage actress. Yeah. She, she got all these huge leads, Ophelia, and she didn't really know how to handle them. So she wasn't, she wasn't actually very good. Mm. She was a lovely person. Yeah. And she had her own uh, private uh, emotional turmoil problem in that mm. first season over yeah. Richard. So that's another, nice. but I, again, I tell that story. It's, oh. just, it's quite complex. <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah, she, so. she was quite miserable a lot of the time. And partly because I think she kind of knew she wasn't really getting there. Right. You know, but she has an absolute, she played Viola in Twelfth Night. I mean, one of the greatest roles ever written. Yeah. And she, she she was just immature. Yeah. Uh, she just didn't get out yet. The person that scored that season was Michael Horton. Ah, yeah. Uh, he was an absolutely magnificent Val Malvolio. And he played Polonius as well in Hamlet. Mm. And absolutely magnificent actor. Yeah. Uh, and um, yes, and he was in, um, uh, uh, not Titus, uh, the... That uh, Shakespeare, which is the this is a difficult Shakespeare, I forget I forget the name of it now. But um, he played uh, Timon of Athens, I think it was. Right, of Athens, I think. I think it was that. And anyway, he he was a patrician nobleman. Um, yeah. No, it wasn't Timon. Uh, uh, you'll have to you'll have to read the book. Well, yes, yeah, a good incentive, isn't it? So, um, well, um, my final question uh, before, I, before I must let you go: um, out of all your career, um, do you have one or two clear favourites that you know, think? Yes, this is what I I really nailed it. It was a great show, great series, and, and what would they be? And 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 briefly, why? Uh, yes, well. <clears throat> Um, in, in television, um, I'm trying to think. Sometimes, you know, I get a, an immediate recollection. I think I, that was really because there, there was some very, uh, very nice. I, I I liked a lot of what I did in the first series of Keeping the Family. Mm -hmm. you know, I think a lot of that, because the scripts were, there were some very good, I think Brian's scripts were good in, in that. And so there's some very nice things to do in that. Um, uh, the, um, isn't it, it's terrible. There was a, <laughs> This is ridiculous, but because this is a stage thing, but there was a production at the Mermaid um, of um, uh, 16th century play. Um, I, I'm sorry, I think it's because I'm getting tired. Oh. Um, but I, I, I played a character called the Dodger. <laughs> who was uh, uh, part of the subplot. The, it was a, a, a jolly uh, 
sort of show about ordinary London folk mm. and a, a tale about somebody who become, eventually becomes Lord Mayor of London. But there was a subplot with some baddies in it. And mm. there was a, a nobleman who was the evil. And he had a sidekick called the Dodger. And I remember I, one of my, uh, I, I had a, it wasn't a long part, but I had an entrance in which I was dressed in black. Mm. And um, I had to rush onto the stage at a thousand miles an hour, screech to a halt and say, and the director suggested I do this with a huge smile and an enormous glee and say, I come to bring bad news. <laughs> and it got the biggest laugh I've ever had in the theatre. And the only laugh that matched it was the episode in Keeping in the Family where I work, I, I'm behind with my work and I, I'm required to be in court the next day. Mm. You remember that episode? I, I did see that yesterday. And yeah. I go to sleep and mm. this message is passed round. Yeah. And that's, that laugh, that's one of my favourite moments in you know, because that is the equal big, biggest, those two laughs are the biggest laughs I ever got in my life. Yeah. Uh, because that laugh, I couldn't finish the sentence. It was so big. Yeah. So those, those are very enjoyable things to do, obviously, mm. because, you know, and I mean, um, if you like and if you want to pursue this, um, I'll remember the question and yeah. uh, make a note of, of other things that I... Because, I mean, obviously, I've done a lot of things. So, um, and, you know, the whole, um, you know, real shelves full of them uh, were enjoyable to do. And others, you know, just completely to be forgotten, you know, to be mm, yeah. go away in the past. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so a lot of how you value a character is how is how it's what response it gets, and particularly with a live audience. If you get a, you know, that's oh, I suppose the whole point of an actor, isn't it? It's to get it's it's to express something to an audience to move them in some some way. And if you achieve yeah. that, well, that's your your job your job done, isn't it? Well, I mean, it's the same with the gas man and Leonard Rossiter. Hmm. I mean, that that's obviously. I mean, that's we have that on our website or YouTube, whatever. And uh, the, the last time we looked, it had got something like 130,000 viewings. Uh, yeah. And, you know, and my designer said, well, have you got any more like that? Because people like that stuff. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I started to look. Uh, I haven't got anything quite like that. But, of course, that was an energy extremely enjoyable scene to mm. play with somebody as good as Leonard. Mm. So that, because again, the, the, it just worked. Mm. We couldn't have won, it couldn't have gone better, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so, so one, looks, one thinks of that, yeah, we did our work there. We <laughs> we got yeah. it right there, you know. Yeah, yeah, there's perfect moments that were always yeah. last the test of time, you know. Yeah, we got it right, time. we got it right. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there are, you know, as I say, I'll bear that in mind, and I'm sure it'll, things will occur to me mm. <clears throat> if, if we ever do this again. Oh, I, I'd be more than open to it. Um, I, well, I, I thank you very much, Robert, for spending so much of your time this evening talking to me. It's been really, uh, a really enjoyable uh, chat. Good. Okay. Well, it was great talking to you. And, and you. Um, enjoy the rest of your week and uh, take care. Okay. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. Hi, Robert. Hello. Hi, hey, Robert. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, yes. Good. How are you? I'm not bad. How are you? Fine. Thank you very much. Fine. Fine. Good. Good. You um, had, had a good week? Uh, perfectly acceptable, yes. 
Yes, probably describes my week as well. Yes, it's perfectly acceptable. Um, so yeah, if, if you're happy, I'll just jump in right in, Robert. And, Please uh, do. Yes, carry yeah. on. Um, so um, we were, you couldn't think of what the title of that of that play was um, uh, when we were talking about um, uh, it was when you play, you played the Dodger. Uh, that was the Shoemaker's Holiday by the Shoemaker's Holiday. That's right. Yes, T Thomas uh, Decker is that how that's you right. Yes, fifteen ninety nine. Just fifteen. Yeah, 99, just for the benefit of uh, those that are watching that might want to, to know that. So I'll just uh, throw that in. Um, so you were saying about some of your favourite memories, experiences, and you were saying that your time at the RSC and theatre in general um, were quite quite stimulating for you. Well, uh, you said you're interested in the theatre, which is Comparatively unusual, I find, with people that want to talk oh. like this, because yeah. um, they're very much, you know, uh, mechan mechanical media orientated and so on. So mm. do you go to the theatre a lot or? Uh, yeah, I just got back from the West End uh, this uh, Saturday. I saw um, Patriots with Tom Hollander. Oh, really? Fantastic. Yes. Um, very so, odd. Have you been going to the theatre all your life, or? Um, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, my mum and dad sort of um, introduced me to it. Um, a, a lot of lovely things that they've that they, they've they've done over the years for me. Uh, I think the first one was um, Whistle Down the Wind. I think I went to oh, really? about sort of sixteen or, or so, and ever since I've, you know, it's, it's, you know, some good years depending on how thick the wallet is at the time um <laughs> might see eight or ten shows a year these days it's um mm. you know, obviously less because everything's more expensive um but i've but i've seen uh, well over 100 west end shows so uh and consider i'm not in in london that's not too bad a feat i don't i don't know do, do you ever get to either stratford or do you ever do I've not been to stratford to to my shame um oh really i've, I've right. been to um uh, the Globe, uh, in uh, obviously in in London, and I saw um, John Lif Lifko in uh, no 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 sorry um, I was thinking of something else I, was, I saw Jonathan Price as mm. in Merchant of Venice uh, oh really ago, and that was uh, that was very good and I've seen a lot of um, Ian McKellen as 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 um, King Lear. And um, the year before that, I think it was uh, Glenda Jackson as King. Oh, really? That, that was very, Gosh. very interesting. And, and some of the cast were actually in, this, in crossover productions. And I asked one of the, the principals afterwards at the stage door, which was his best experience. And he preferred the Ian McKellen one because I think it was a bit more fun, whereas Jenna, Gla Jenna Gla Jackson one was very, um, you know, it was... Very serious, if you, if you if you know what I mean. I wish I whether that's a reflection on her as an actress. I, I don't know, but it was a more sort of um, bare bones production. Um, in the curious thing about it is, did she play it as a man? Yes, yes, yes she did. Yes, um, uh, because I, I I chose not to go. Right. Yes, <laughs> because uh, you know there's been a lot of fun with people switching sexes and so on, mm. uh, and and uh, it, it's. Hard to tell uh, whether it strays into gimmickry. Uh, with Glenda, I mean, she was a wonderful actress. She was a much better actress than she was a politician. <laughs> and uh, but I thought I just wondered if she played it as a man. And I got by then she was the age where she was asexual, probably anyway. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. so it's sort of you know gender neutral sort of. That's right. Clothing yeah. and what what I think was one of the most impressive things I saw was Ian McKellen. Uh, which I'm actually I'm going to see at, at Theatre Royal Windsor this Saturday by coincidence. He's in a, in a new play. Yes. Um, but a couple of years ago, he was playing Hamlet. Yeah. <laughs> yes. What's, what's this going to be be like? You know, and 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 some of the cast were in reversals, um, different races, all sorts of, and it was completely um, just sort of um, all accepting, all encompassing, and. You, you know you wouldn't but you it's five minutes you you get that he's hamlet you know and he's running around the stage like a 20 year old which which kind of 
kind of helps and multiple sort of e elevations and and things. So, um, so of course you've got to have the energy regardless of what age age you are for that role. Um, but talking about perhaps one of the most surprising things I saw was Bradley Cooper and the Elephant Man. Oh, really? And he had no makeup or anything, no prosthetics, and he comes out at the beginning of the play um, topless. You know, one of the most, you know, handsome men in the world, arguably. And the doctor, um, his doctor is describing to the audience his physical condition. And as he says everything, Bradley changes his body position, the way his hands are. Yeah, right. and, and again, you completely buy that this this sort of demigod is yeah. you know, is, is I do. Yeah. Yes. As a matter of interest, I can't remember what, whether you've told me or not. Have you read either of my books? Not not yet. It is it is on my it is on my list. Once well, I once the, next the, payday. I'm okay. The reason I ask is that I cover my uh, experiences with major companies, uh, mm. the Old Vic in the first book and, and the RSC in the second. Yeah. Obviously, I was in um, I was in rep, and I, I don't know how much you know of the sort of back, backstage um, flavor and the difference between one company and another. Mm. Uh, rep is very much come and go, you know. So I, but the, uh, contrasting experiences since I think you want to talk about the theatre this evening mm, absolutely yeah. is uh, <clears throat> straight from RADA I went into the old Vic company where the the boss of the time Michael Bentor was given a brief that he could do the whole of Shakespeare uh, over well at first it was two years and eventually I think he was there uh, possibly a total of seven years, but anyway, we, and of course he had to repeat the plays by then. But um, uh, uh, theatre companies, I, again, I don't know how much you know about them. I mean, groups of people are obviously uh, um, uh, a fascinating study because mm. uh, I, I suspect that people who simply turn up to an office every day uh, 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 fall into a category very different uh, or with some similarities or, uh, compared with a group of actors because uh, when you get a group of uh, there are so many um, uh, uh, cross uh, trending um, uh, enthusiasm tensions you know uh, flavors and the when I started at the Old Vic, uh, which is 1953, the, um, there was still a, a, a huge amount of deference socially. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, there were people who mattered. There were people who thought they were important and thought that you should treat them as if they were important and show it. And so uh, going to the Old Vic, I, the thing was that I... I did. I simply saw uh, 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 a posting at RADA that said they were holding auditions. Nobody helped me to do this or suggested anything. I just thought, well, I'll apply. Hmm. So I just literally took myself along, did an audition, and I, I, I was accepted. And of course, at the very, very bottom of the company, which meant that uh, you were exp you you were. Uh, you know, marginally above the status of a slave, really. Mm. You know, in in in, a, in our kind of society then, and uh, completely at the uh, behest and command of absolutely anybody around who had any authority. You know, they were absolutely the lowest of the low, and so. <laughs> um, but you were lucky to be in a company with a an amazing historical name like the Old Vic Company. You know going back to lots of, uh, you know, and of course, uh, at that time, it was, um, it was, it was at the Old Vic, and which before long became the national, the, the site of the National Theatre, but it was just before that. <clears throat> hmm. Now, the thing was, that the interesting thing was that the, the director who'd been, uh, offered this uh, opportunity to do all of Shakespeare's plays over X years, 
was a man called Michael Bentor, who made his reputation quite quickly, uh, uh, mostly, mostly in the classics, uh, working with the stars. <clears throat> and he is a very odd character. He was, uh, he was gay, uh, but he was also, he was a very big, handsome man, but uh, extremely socially incompetent. <laughs> he was shy and he, he, ne he never looked at you. And given the time, the period, uh, depending on your status in the company, uh, that it depended. Uh, your status didn't come. It depended on how you were addressed, and anybody short of the middle-ranking uh, people in the company were always addressed by their surnames. So I, I happened to be there for you. I was kept on for a second year. <laughs> I was always Mr. Gillespie. Whereas, of course, the, the company in the first season was headed by Richard Burton and Claire Bloom. Hmm. And of course, with Richard and Michael Horden and Faye Compton, it was Richard and Faye and, you know, Michael. Uh, so there was this extraordinary distinction in the company. And somewhere in the middle, it changed over. You know, you, uh, us, some of us were by then, uh, uh, emancipated, emancipated, liberated enough to be uh, quite uh, cynical and amused by all this. We wonder, we, we used to check, think, you know, is Robert Hardy going to be called Mr. Hardy or is he going to be called Robert, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and because uh, he was in the middle of the company and John Neville and people like that. Uh, the, the very odd thing about, the thing about a, a company a theatre company is that the leadership is incredibly important and the leadership comes always from the major players. And Richard Burton <clears throat> was uh, unusual. He was not a standard uh, of the day theatrical. Mm. He, he sort of uh, um, seemed to be, take pleasure in the fact that his background was different he came from a kind of rough background. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, Richard was very different. And he, he was the kind of person who would, although he was the star, and in a way he was a kind of superstar by then, and um, he, he, was, he, was, he was mates with everybody. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he wouldn't stick to any kind of hierarchy at all. And so... And th this made Michael Bentall, the boss, quite uneasy because he, he was, you know, he, he crossed boundaries. Mm. Uh, and, of course, uh, when he was around, when, of course, he was around a lot because he was the major star. Um, uh, no, there, there was a confusion about exactly how to behave, how deferential to be and how made to be. So it was weirdly uneasy. Mm. And the, uh, because, um, because of uh, Richard was very much um, a, a kind of um, breaker of rules and a kind of conventions didn't apply to him. Mm. So he would just, you know, he'd come in into rehearsal smoking and things like that, you know, and you know, and there was quite a, Michael Bento was quite mildly scared about asking him, you know, to, could, could, you, could you put your cigarette out, please, you know. <laughs> and so uh, there was, uh, you, uh, he, he was also very, uh, Richard was unpredictable and volatile. So instead of being a steady leader of the company as the big star, mm -hmm. you were co constantly waiting for, Days because he would also be quite sulky, and there were days when he would, you know, he'd just not be in a good mood, and then sort of people took care not to speak to him. And so that doesn't make uh, for uh, 
a, a, a proper collective, a sense of collect of a collective feeling, because you, you're constantly where it, where, wondering you, how to be. And very quickly, Richard formed a clique around himself, and there were just mostly guys in the company that he became great mates with, mm. and they became a very definite group of you know middle-ranking actors, John Neville, Robert Hardy, and so on. Uh, and they absolutely just separated themselves out. And so when they went to the pub, if you were in the same pub, you were on sufferance as to whether you'd be asked to join or not. Mostly, <clears throat> unless you could um, uh, play your cards right with Richard, it would be better to keep away. And so the company began to... Uh, then there was the, the anomaly of Claire Bloom. Of course, Claire, I think, is still alive. Mm -hmm. And she had just been, she was incredibly young uh, and very, very, very inexperienced. But um, Charlie Chaplin had made her a superstar in way, probably way before her time. She, so she hadn't matured as an actress at all. But she was given all the super juvenile leads. She even played Viola in Twelfth Night. And quite frankly, she didn't actually understand it. She wasn't grown up enough to understand. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, which was a, another complication, over the, over the, it was a year that we were there to, together in this company, um, we noticed she became very weepy. And almost classically, she'd kind of fallen for Richard. Mm. And it's a, it's a very um, <clears throat> layered and interesting, complex story. But he, he didn't encourage her at all. Mm. So she tried to be part of where he was. But he did. Now, he was married to a, a splendid Welsh girl. And there's a story behind that, which I think I would leave to print rather than mention now. But mm. there was an issue, a very personal thing between himself and his wife, which inhibited Richard at the time. That only became clear later. I think Elizabeth Taylor helped to unwind him eventually. <laughs> but as a result, he was very much a bloke's bloke. Hard drinking, uh, you know, ready to ready for a brawl and everything. I mean, there was one rehearsal when he he kept the entire company. I think it was for King John, and we were rehearsing, uh, waiting for about an hour and a half. No, no mobile phones. He couldn't. Nobody knew where he was. What had happened to him? And uh, hilarious story. Eventually, turned up perfunctorily apologised to anybody. And Michael Bentall had the courage then, very tentatively to say, you, you realise, Michael, uh, realise, Richard, don't you, that you've kept the entire company waiting for an hour and a half. You're, uh, so, well, anyway, so Richard told his story. <laughs> he was driving to work and a, and a taxi driver irritated him. I could have gone through some lights and didn't. So Richard took his car out of gear, just rolled gently into the back of the taxi and bumped him. The taxi, instead of letting it go, moved forward and then reversed back into Richard. Richard got cross, revved up, went into the back of the taxi and drove him round the corner. <laughs> then they got out and started fighting. And it all ended up in the police station mm. with, uh, uh, you know, each having to, depositions being taken. And so, and then he turned up for work. And his, uh, you know, I mean, being Richard, he, uh, the, the apologies were very perfunctory and he just got over with it. So, that might give you an all overall flavour 
mm-hmm. of that kind of company, and uh, uh, which was not coherent, full of factions, uh, cliques. The young people kept together on the whole, uh, and especially as they were, they had no status, and so on. Mm-hmm. And I, and that affected the work. <clears throat> yeah. As a result. You didn't, uh, I had no experience of working in a, in a theatre company, but I sensed the lack of connection on stage a lot of the time. There was, there was a great deal of orating, and, uh, and the, uh, the other thing was that the director didn't have the um, intelligent control to try and unify people's styles. So plays were played by different people in different theater styles. Some people were extremely conversational on stage, very modern, very more uh, like the way actors play now. Mm. And there were still people, uh, the the guy who played um, Claudius in Hamlet, the king, who was totally in living in the past, you know, though yet of Hamlet, our dear brother's death, the memory be green and the dust be fitted. And so you had this different, you know, some people chatted, some people, extraordinary variety of styles on stage, which again was confusing in my view in terms of interpreting the play. And I wondered what, um, what an audience would make of it. And as a result, the reviews were on the whole mixed. For the whole season, mm. um, probably uh, the one of the better shows. Uh, well, no, there wasn't a consistent show really. Uh, there was a magnificent performance by Michael Horne of Malvolio in Twelfth Night, uh, which I can I, I can never imagine bettered. It's sort of for me the def- definitive performance of Malvolio, but sadly. Claire Bloom played Viola, and she was, you know, just too immature to understand who Viola was. So it was a there was a very weird feeling about that. And I, I uh, at the time, though only just out of radar, uh, felt competent to, to judge that and to make those, uh, you know, to assess that this was an uneasy and. Um, uncomfortable company mm. doing comparatively indifferent work. Yeah. Uh, I was there for the, for the second season and uh, that, that was time, that time was, uh, that was um, Paul Rogers and Anne Todd leading. Again, Anne Todd is a film actress. And so playing uh, Lady Macbeth was out of her depth. Mm. So again, uh, you know, some good things, some very good things. Mm. Paul Rogers is a very good actor, and so uh, you know, on his day in the right thing. Anyway, very mixed experience. Mm. Well, when I, when I, in my head, when I left RADA, I thought, well, if there is a route through, uh, you know, a career route via every kind of classic, you know, Ibsen, Shakespeare, whatever, Strindberg. Uh, I'd be happy to be part of that. And nothing like that happened at all. And so, as, as you are aware, in terms of following me, I <clears throat> and I started getting television. And eventually, the only reason that we're sitting here at all is mm. because... I started being employed to be funny mm. in situation comedy, and that's what everybody and anybody knows me about. Mm. So, <clears throat> all all the other theatre work, blah blah, blah all, over the years, is uh, unless you read my books, uh, you know, is uh, nobody knows about. It's just off mm. the record, mm. and so. I mean, I, I'd given up all thought of being in, in a theatre company ever again, 
Although, I mean, I, I went to the theatre a lot because it's one of my main interests. Mm. And, uh, you know, I knew about the, the Royal Shakespeare Company. And I remember just as a token thing along the way uh, when, you know, the, you, you, auditions came up and you decide, right, uh, I'll, I'll apply, I'll take that audition. And I did at least one audition for an old Vic company and just got nowhere at all. And uh, just, I never, never dreamt that I was, you know, I'd ever be in a company again. <laughs> the weird thing was, <clears throat> I eventually, uh, uh, for nine years, I had no agent. Eventually, I got a competent agent. And eventually, I was, um, uh, was taken on by a top agency. And... Um, I got a phone call out of the blue one day saying uh, the RSC have been on to me and they say, would you be prepared to join the company? Somebody's dropped out. Hmm. Uh, not to play major parts, but there are some parts. So <laughs> I said, okay. So I went to see, I think, all the directors involved, certainly to them, and um, the, there was a part of uh, um, uh, in, uh, it was a part of a character called Technicus in the Broken Heart, and then there was a part in Twelfth Night, um, uh, and um, so on. Mm -hmm. So I. Uh, and the only stipulation I made, I said, so they said, uh, okay, you can come. <laughs> and uh, the only thing I said, I, I won't understudy. Mm -hmm. Because I'd learned at the Old Vic, uh, obviously everybody had to understudy. And I did go on, but fortunately not for a large part. Because I realized that it, you know, some people can do it. I've, I'm amazed at some people's ability to go on at short notice, having just learned to part more or less with not much rehearsal. And of course, at the Old Vic, we, had, we ended up with virtually no understood rehearsals. You know, there'd be four or five month gap, which is outrageous, you know. But people did go on, but you know, I, I only had to go on for a uh, comparatively small part. So I thought, I, I, they need me. <laughs> I'm going to stipulate I won't understudy. Hmm. Uh, and very reluctantly, they accepted that. But then he got, got there. And the extraordinary thing was, I was there for almost two and a half years. And it turned into, as close as I can imagine, my dream company situation. The, the, there were two companies, by the way, because there was so much work, the, the effort was split into two groups, and we, we really didn't overlap. We just each did our own lot of plays. Uh, our, our company was headed by Alex Jennings and Stella Gone, and I can't remember, I'd have to look up the other company, but it was that season. As I say, so I was at the Stratford for a year, and it was actors' heaven. The, the, uh, for the entire time I was there, there wasn't a crossword between the actors. I mean, you know, to be in a position to say those words, any actor watching this will know that, that is close to miraculous. The act, the company, all respected each other's work, all <clears throat> knew that they were good at what they did, all supported each other totally. And as a result, I was doing the kind of work that I imagined I might have liked to do all my life. Very late, very much late. I was in my 60s by then. Mm. Uh, so it was 40 years on. And I was just uh, completely amazed 
that this was possible and impressed. And um, <laughs> um, yeah, so it, it, the, 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 the only fight in my entire time there was between one of the actors and a director. They, they, they disagreed, disagreed about an interpretation of a character. And that was the only time there was an actual quarrel, you know, uh, pu public quarrel. Hmm. And, and I can't tell you how unusual and amazing and extraordinary that is. Hmm. So uh, it, it, it's one of the most contrasting experiences I can ever imagining, imagine having, you know. So I don't know how, uh, you know, that is a, a general summary of my experience of, uh, of theatre, but because a, a company of actors with so, so much going on, you know, you can imagine there's the, there's the whole risk thing of going on stage trying to remember words and all that and, and the tensions and then the, the private lives to be, be kept going and the you know potential affairs and splittings up and you know and it's 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 highly incestuous mm. uh, and to find a company in which there are no quarrels for that amount of time it's just extraordinary yeah yes yeah, and the work being very good yeah, I am now repeating myself, so perhaps I'll leave it there. Well, no, I've, I've had, uh, yeah, fascinating sort of contrast, and it, as you say, it is a very sort of high, high, highly strong environment because, of course, you've got the hours. You're doing seven, eight shows a week. It's very unsociable, so you're sort of, you know, it's, it must be a huge strain. So no wonder people do sort of find it a, a, a bit difficult. Um, I was I was at the um, Olivier Awards earlier this year. And um, so Derek Jacobi picked up the Lifetime Achievement Award and he was talking about his experiences with Laurence Olivier and how he always called him sir. And, it, you know, it, and that was, you know, if you if you accidentally called him Laurence or Mr. Olivier or God forbid, Lowry, that happened a couple of times, he said you were, you know, almost almost showing the door, you know, you or, you, or took you a long time to to recover from it. Who got angry, Larry or somebody on his behalf? Oh, it would it, it, even have been Larry, yeah. yeah. Himself. Yeah, yeah. I think I, it, you saw about the structure of, 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 of the company. I think in, he I mean, was in, pretty in, much like, like God. And I've had a few people. Oh, yes. Talk oh, I, I remember yeah. that very clearly. Mm. I, I was never, I, I met Lillivier with, a, we were mm. all trying to get into supporters taking over the theatre with a colleague of mine. Yeah. But, um, and he was very affable and very, very, casual and ordinary but yeah. i can imagine you know whereas richard of course richard burton um he he'd have been yeah. he he'd set you up wrong if you called yeah. him sir yeah. it was just ludicrous yeah so it is extraordinary contrast you see hmm. i mean i mean did you ever suffer from, from nerves on stage did you have a way of sort of getting past that that kind of thing uh i have never met any actor who wasn't nervous about going on stage it's just hmm. that people cope with it differently yeah, yeah. You know, so, I mean, there are, I mean, I, I have known actors who are ha uh, sick every time they, before they go on stage. Mm -hmm. I worked, I directed an actor in Dublin <clears throat> who, um, he, 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 was a, he was a local star. And uh, on, on, he was extremely popular, but he, he was actually a good actor, but he, he, uh, nobody had risked talking to him uh, straight, mm -hmm. and he tended to uh, inject his performances by with face pulling, so he would mug his way through, you know. And I uh, was hired to direct a play in which he was one of the leads, and uh, I said. Uh, said to him, have you thought, you know, you're perfectly capable of just relaxing, being yourself, you're a good actor, uh, without all these twitches, you know, just, you know, just 
you know the lines, you know what the character is, you know what the story is, just just come on and be that person. Don't work so hard, don't feel you need to contribute, you know. Mm. And um, he tried it on the first, I wondered what would happen on the first night, whether he'd revert to what his fans seemed to like, you know, which is all right. <laughs> and, um, and the tripping over his feet and whatever. And he tried it, he risked it. And he was terrific, he got tremendous laughs. And he said to me, and he actually thanked me afterwards, and he said, I'll tell you something. Tonight was the first time on a first night where I didn't go to the loo before the curtain up and vomit. <laughs> <laughs> so there was that sort of sense of, I know what I'm doing. Mm. So a lot of actors, I mean, obviously, it depends on the part and what rehearsals be like. I mean, you, you can get a very good actor who feels very uncomfortable with the director, uh, feels he hasn't been rehearsed properly or whatever it is, and will just go on nervous because he's just in, insecure in a completely other part in a different situation. He'll know exactly what he wants to do. And then there is just a kind of heightened tension. Mm. Of uh, about, If you're not nervous, something's wrong. Mm. You know, yeah. I mean, it, then, you, then you should be sweeping, sweeping the office, really. Uh, mm. <laughs> it's, it's a very, very risky thing to come out, you know, pretending you can remember all those words mm. and pretending they're just coming to to spontaneously, naturally at the, on on at that moment. It's mm. an extremely complex. Bit, bit of behavior mm. and so of course but the thing is it's like it, i think it's quite like the, the, the you know ultimate athlete the, the athlete who's on top of his game who just said i know i can do this obviously i'd like to do it my best and i might just tip the bar or something on the height i want to reach but you know but i can, i know i'm i can do it you know so it's that kind of feeling of, when it's at its best yeah and what I always find remarkable is, is when you see one man shows and you haven't got a company to to hide or bounce off of. And it's just it's just uh, um, Simon Callow did being Shakespeare a few years ago and he was you know, recounting Shakespeare's life. And Patrick Stewart did a Christmas Carol on his own and played all the characters and told others, you know, and you just sort of think how you I don't think there's many actors that can can do that kind of thing really it's, it's, it's a special talent I think sort of hold an audience you know like like a stand-up comic you know it's, it's oh, that's right yeah very very tricky um I, I did I, I was wondering now when you go to theatres that there is always a lot of fans at the stage door and there's interactions with with cast I, I assume that is a fairly new phenomenon in terms of the relationship with the audience and and because that and celebrity, because now celebrities seem to be very um, approachable, very contactable, whereas I think they were a bit more mythic um, beforehand, if that is that fair to say. So when you were in, you know, was was there fans lining up, lining up to see Richard Burton when you came out of the, the theatre and things like that? Uh, the Old Vic. Mm. Do you know the Old Vic Theatre at all? I've been there a few times, yeah. The stage used to stage door used to be on the Waterloo Road. Oh, so now it's the other. They've switched it to the back. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it used to be on the Waterloo Road. Hmm. Whenever Richard was playing, the crowds of girls blocked the pavement <laughs> totally. You hmm. could uh, ordinary passers-by couldn't get through. Hmm. There were literally hundreds of girls, and they were had been see, they would have seen the play from the gallery, most of them, which is what they could afford. Mm. And early on, this was especially for Hamlet. Early on, when Richard came out through the door, the, the stage door, uh, immediately. 
the girls were shoving their their uh, programs or mm. bits of paper or notebooks or whatever it was. You sign this, sign this, sign this, and he would just spend quite a long time. And 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 eventually he'd just have to say, I'm, say, I'm, I'm sorry, I've got an appointment, and that's it. Mm. And this went on for just every, I mean, I mean, just, you know, you just knew that would, you know, if Richard was on, <laughs> there'd be hundreds of girls at the stage hall. And eventually got pissed off. Because uh, uh, Richard uh, got pissed off quite easily. And, and in the end, he, he I mean, he didn't particularly feel he owed people anything that much. Mm. I mean, he realised that you know fans are important, but I mean they were they were going to they were going to come anyway, you know. And so he started to uh, first of all, he started to cut short the autograph giving, and and then eventually he started to escape. And so we would come out through the door and say, "Ah," oh, and then they'd go walk back as it wasn't Richard. Yeah. And they say, "Is Richard coming out? Is Richard coming out?" And I said, um, oh, "Sorry, Richard's gone." No, no. So, right from the beginning of my life in the theatre, mm-hmm. I was aware of this superstardom effect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and it was just him. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you know, we we would follow him out, mm-hmm. and <laughs> I mean, one or two people who had. Substantial parts of the company would kind of vaguely look around, say, "Is anybody going to ask me for my autograph?" Absolutely not. Mm. You know, there's only one person they wanted. Mm. Uh, I, I can't remember about Claire. <clears throat> Claire was very retiring and shy. Anyway, mm. I think probably she would have signed a few. <clears throat> but he was, you know, the ultimate star. Yeah. Uh, mm. You know, and there was nobody. There's nothing like it in the second season. Obviously, there were still a lot of, uh, already. There were always people at the stage door. Mm. You know, I mean, it's crowds mm. of people, but obviously there was nothing much. Richard, uh, no, you know, um, Paul Rod. Nobody's going to come out for Paul Rogers. <laughs> no young women were going to come out. Mm. Uh, Anne Todd, of course, was a film star, so she got some, had a bit of a following. Mm. <clears throat> but it was, um, you know, so I'm I'm used to fans from that from then on. You know. Mm. Crowds of them. Yeah, yeah. I went to see um, Martin Shaw in a play, and I wanted to get his autograph, and he bolted out the stage, the stage door. You know, you didn't really know. You know, it was almost like a blur, and everyone was like, "Who was that?" Well, that was Martin just running off to the pub or something. Like that, you know. Well, the um, actors just get very, very sick of it. You know, because it can't. I mean, if you, well, you can, can you imagine with hundreds of girls, he'd have yeah. been there till morning. There was only six of us, so I'm not sure. Oh, I see. But well, he, he it, might have had some trade. Then it's just a personal it? thing. He doesn't want to know. Yeah, sometimes you can gauge the character of somebody, how good they are with, with the fans. So I always find it a bit quite interesting. And um, James L. Jones, wonderful. You know, he, he, he'll talk to everybody all day. When you come up to him, he will ask, you know, where you come from, what do you do? And he, he's very interested. And um, he just sort of sat in his car and, you know, and, and let people just, you know, through the uh, through the window, you know, chatting with with, with people. Um, so I think, yeah, it does depend on 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 the person, I, I, I guess, really. Um, I mean, how do you think the old Vic has, has changed over the years? Because obviously it became very sort of popularist, didn't it, with, with Kevin Spacey coming in and um, giving it new well, life. Do you think it's sort of... Because now, of course, it's got Groundhog Day, the musical in there. Is it sort of, I think it would always, to me, seem to be quite a sort of sit very, one of the very serious theatres that didn't perhaps get some of the more populist West End stuff. Do you think, how do you feel on the well, uh, uh, To me, the main thing about the theatre is <laughs> that it should be pr- producing. Uh, mm. And... Um, I, I because what what happened after the the Michael Bentall um, uh, Shakespeare canon phase, you know, um, was uh, it, it had a kind of it was a, it, it was quite a difficult theatre to get people to go to 
And I think that's one of the reasons that they 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 say have huge attractions. So that was Richard Burton, Claire Bloom, blah blah blah, mm -hmm. they, and and Todd. So and it worked to a degree. It, it worked, mm -hmm. it, you know. But uh, it 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 it, it puttered along, and then I think it there was an interim phase where uh, I'm going to forget his name. Um, uh, famous director, anyway. B people tried things out, but then it became uh, the um, kind of cradle of the National Theatre, didn't it? Hmm. Yes. And I thought that was terrific because the, the, the National Theatre repertoire was world theatre, really. And it seems to me that's right. Hmm. I mean, I, th I, I think a theatre, I, I suppose I feel... Uh, any no, any theatre should should be spared um, absolute uh, rubbish. I mean, have you heard of a play called Run for Your Wife? I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it. I don't know much oh. about it. Anything. Now there are comedy aficionados who absolutely love that. It's um. um it's um it's a pin it's 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 a it's an english steal from a from a, uh from an american play <clears throat> in which um uh, uh, what's the uh, plane com famous plane company boeing oh. it, 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 i think it's called boeing boeing and it um that involves a, a, an airline pilot who is running three women at the time. And um, Run For Your Wife is a, a Ray Cooney adaptation with a taxi driver just running two women at the time. Mm. And so one is supposed to be highly amused that this person drives his taxi. I can't remember the detail, but, mm. you know, and is able to uh, in, in, part, in, in um, part of his work schedule pop in and service his one, one girlfriend and with the other half of the schedule. <laughs> and of course, the problem is stopping the meeting. Yes, yes. Now, this was, there are people around who may watch this thing. Who think it's one of the most hilarious plays ever? Well, when I was with my then again finally top agent, William Morris, they were called. I may have mentioned that. Um, uh, they said there is this play, Run for Your Wife, and at one time actors hoped to be in a play, and they hoped it would run forever. And there would be people, a few people, who would be in a play in the West End for six years. Uh, but gradually, more and more actors began to not get bored. And I remember um, I interviewed Ralph Richardson at, at the King's Head uh, because I had a play that he might have uh, played the lead in. And he was playing in the West End. Uh, and he said, it's getting houses. We're doing business. But uh, uh, what? she wants to leave the cast. She's, she, you know. And so <laughs> there was a, Sir Ralph Richardson saying, and he actually said to me, I mean, I can't understand these younger people. He said, after all, it's work. <laughs> And that changed enormously, and people started to say, "I don't want to be in the West End for I, I'll get bored after three months." Mm. And so I was a member of I, my agent said, "They've asked you if you want to take over from uh, Terry Scott, mm. who was another sitcom person, of course." And I went to see it, and uh, I just thought it was embarrassingly 
uh, infantile. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and I realized it was just me. There are people who have got to be careful because there are people who I'm in touch with at the moment who, who kind of say, oh, and, and it turns out that, as I say, people like um, Brian Murphy and so, were, did one of the three months stunts in the play. So I have to be very careful about mm. saying, what a load of crap, you know. Uh, so, you know, tastes are uh, uh, so different. But um, I, and that's the kind of play I would have always tried to avoid being in. And the other one is, I mean, I can definitely tell you, is anything, any play based on an Agatha Christie story. <laughs> I mean, that was absolutely the pits. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think she's, uh, she's the richest writer, writer, I think, that has ever lived. Uh, and I think one of the worst. So, uh, so, but that, so it just tells you something about, you know, popular taste, really, uh, you know, so w one cannot use oneself as a yardstick or about lots of things, you know, one just has to say, well, I like this and I don't like that. But it seems to me that what the, what the Ovik got right when it became the National Theatre was this tremendous mix of play, because there, there are some, I mean, there are some, Jos Fedo farces, which are absolutely brilliant. I mean, you're, they're difficult to translate from the French, which is why, why they don't get done uh, anymore here. But, uh, but you know, there's some, you know, I love farce, but uh, it, to me it has to be classy. So one makes these distinctions, but I think, so it, it's, it's, it's very subjective. I mean, you go to, uh, you know, a uh, place like, uh, 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 sorry. <laughs> so we say about the, 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 the like the Vic, and you yeah. you kind of think, why is it doing this? Why are they doing this? Mm. So you know, it's you, you apply your own standards. Really. Oh yeah, I mean, I never really go by reviews because it, it's just opinion. So it's it's you know, um, I, I saw. Um, uh, James L. Jones, Vanessa Redgrave, and Much to Do About Nothing at the old the old Vic, and Mark Mark Relantz was was directing it, and mm. and it got terrible reviews. It wasn't the, admittedly the best thing because it was very sort of experimental, but I kind of got a bit what they were doing, and you know, you know, mature actors playing, you know, a bit like Ian McKellen, you know, not age appropriate, but it kind of it mm. kind of works. So it's it is. If, if things don't always work out, you admire it for, for trying something. Uh... No, that's right. I mean, you, I, I go with on the on the basis of forgiving them because I know what they how hard it is what what they're doing. Everybody's trying very hard, you know. Mm -hmm. I, when you just say that didn't work, no, or, I'm glad I did. Yeah, and there are certain things I wouldn't cross the road to see. So there we are. I mean, how do you stop yourself getting bored as a as a theatre actor? You you always sort of. Tinker with the performance a little bit, always try and improve or adjust certain things. Uh, I think that very that's interesting because it varies very much between persons. Uh, there are actors. I, I mean, I, I've worked with actors who very quickly get to the. They feel they've got to the end of what they can do with a part, hmm. and then some of them. Uh, I think. Um, uh, lacking in responsibility, start to just go on and uh, uh, just go it through routinely. And mm. if you're on stage with somebody doing that, it's it's not much fun mm. because you can feel their their heads are somewhere else. They know it well enough. They're responding automatically. <clears throat> and I, I to me, that is cheating the audience because the audience has only come once. And yeah. you know, so it's it's um. Technique, which I think everybody has to learn at drama school and keep in mind all the time, is how to keep something fresh. And I think it's perfectly possible because one, if you in your mind, if you're thinking, this lot have never seen this story before, so you think, right, I've got to start from the beginning, going to those people's heads, saying. 
Yes, this this will surprise you. This will surprise you. That you didn't expect that, did you? Ah, oh, you knew this was coming. So you know, it's as it were understanding their enjoyment of it and their their involvement with it. And I think that's one way of of uh, keeping it fresh, you know. And it it varies enormously. But I mean, a, a, a story I tell in one of the in one of my books. I, I was a at the Mermaid, Mermaid Theatre with Spike Milligan hmm. in, a, in a, he was hired by Bernard Miles to play um, Ben Gunn in Treasure Island. And in, in the first week, he was absolutely stunningly brilliant because his, the things he dared do on stage, an average actor wouldn't have dared to do. He did echoes of himself and he did, it was an absolutely stunning performance. And I had to come on after his seed and I used to watch from the wings because it was so amazing. But then after a week, he got bored. Right. And he started to say, here, Jim, Jim, you see that rock over there? Yeah, that one, that, by the exit sign. And he started talking about, uh, oh, somebody's moving the second row. Are you, is it, are you all right? Comfortable? And so or just, and it was presumably a way of keeping himself fresh in his own mind. Yeah. But mm. I think it was extremely destructive and it, mm. a great shame. So that was an example of, because of course he wasn't your average actor anyway. No. Um, he was a, uh, in, in, his, in his place and in, at his time, a kind of genius. Mm. But this was uh, insulting, really. Well, well, yeah, yeah. The the audience is, you know, not getting what what they're kind of sort of. I mean, I mean, some people might really love it, but it, it, it depends. Again. Yeah, there'd be a few people that go, his goon goon following would probably think, yeah. is, "Oh, this is hilarious," but not the majority of the audience because no. they yeah. were coming to see a yarn, you know, a classical yarn. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so when it came to matinee performances, were those more difficult to keep people's professionalism? Was it kind of a bit? Well, of... uh, there's always a there's a, doing the same thing on the twice on the same day. Yeah, is um, it's just another exercise in 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 some kind of focusing, and if, you know, one was aware. I mean, because it became even more onerous because at the Mermaid. <laughs> with Bernard trying to find ways of, because he was very inefficient as a manager, mm. but one of his successes was Treasure Island. So he revived it whenever he could. And uh, I remember one year I was in it again, and he decided that during the sort of festive season coming up to Christmas, uh, not only did we always play twice nightly at The Mermaid, but there were two days in the week when he played three times. Wow. He did three performances. Yeah. And that the main thing about that was just staying awake because the physical drain was absolutely phenomenal. So that wow. was almost like a, an endurance, a matter of physical endurance rather than anything else. Rather than keeping fresh, you just oh. by the third one you were doing it in your sleep. You know, hmm. is it difficult to wind down after a fifth performance of all the adrenaline? Is it? Does it take a while to sort of it to sort of the the, you... the 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 performance that's the most difficult to wind down from is the first night. Yeah, I, I mean, a lot of actors will tell you that they'll they were awake most of the night after a first night. But then it becomes well. This is what I do, and I know what I'm doing in this, and you know, yeah. And you can't go on if if you, if you start being uh, affected all the time. In that you 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 you'll end up needing treatment. You know? Yeah, you'll burn out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Did did you um, did you ever work with Roy Kinnear on stage? Uh, well, I was at drama school with Roy Kinnear. Oh, right. He was in my class. Ah, yeah, and. Uh, I'm trying to think what when when we were. Uh, I have to go back to to my book. Uh, when when were we together? Well, we knew each other often. I mean, 
he did a guest appearance in in one of my keeping the family shows for instance oh yeah i think i've seen that clip yeah it's We've quite seen that clip. he's very it's good very good yes yeah he's lovely um and i did i i was in one of his so uh so in that sense we worked together yes yeah. But we didn't work together. I don't think I don't remember we worked together a great deal mm. in companies, but we were in television shows, you know. But of course, you're often quite separate. You're doing separate stuff, you know. Yeah. You just meet, do the work, and go. So I was uh, I was extremely distressed by the way he ended his life because mm. uh, knowing Roy. Um, I, again, it's something I write about in in my book. Yeah. Is uh, <clears throat> Roy was not, would not have been a natural rider of a horse. And uh, yeah, it was um, Richard Lester film, wasn't it? That one, the um, Turn the Musketeers, I think it was. It, it? Yeah, um, I can't remember now. I, I did look it up, but yeah. uh, I can imagine Roy, uh, somebody going up to Roy and saying, "You ride, don't you?" And and Roy saying, "Well." Uh, 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 yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, it's a totally quiet horse, perhaps, you know, you know mm. just a gap, a pussy gap, you know, so, yeah, uh, okay, I'm getting on the bloody thing, and uh, instead of saying, I've never ridden a horse in my life, you can see what I look like, I'm overweight, I can't help that, blah, 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 you know, I, I remember when, when I heard about it, I was extremely angry. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did an event with, with Annette and uh, Andre, you mentioned before, and yes. she did um, a funny thing on the way to the forum. Oh, yes. And Richard Lester, and, and there's a scene when she's in this chariot that's bolting down, with, with horse drawn, and there's all kinds of action going on. And and, and Richard Lester put, put her, her, she was doing it, and, and there was a sense of just getting the shot. So whether or not the two could arguably be you know, there's a little pattern, unfortunately, a bit of recklessness on Richard Lester movies. I I, I don't know really, but uh... no, a, a lot of film directors do this. Mm. Uh, I, I, there's an instance of um, uh, um, Lewis Collins and um, thing. Um, oh, Martin Shaw. What was the show they were in? Oh, um, professionals. The professionals. There's an episode of the professionals. Mm. Uh, where we were running, we, we were running. Yeah. Presumably, somebody was in pursuit. Of, I think I was with the crooks, and uh, no, I, I was helping the the um, the, uh, the the clip I've seen is you're sort of going over walls. And that's right. Yeah. And well, and there's like, a yeah. bit that's cut out there. <clears throat> Where uh, Louis Collins and thing, uh, <laughs> um, we had a running sequence. I was helping them get get somewhere. Mm. They do, they put the pressure on me to help them, and so we had this running, and we came to a point where there was a, a sheer drop. <laughs> it, I, I reckoned it. I tried to me measure it. it was, I reckon it was about twelve feet. And um, we came up to this and stopped because to just run and jump that that dis that um, that kind of uh, mm. drop depth, you could you could seriously injure yourself. You could your pelvis or an ankle or whatever. Mm. And uh, the director was down there saying, Look, "What what's the problem? What's the problem?" And I said, well, it's a bit, uh, and he says, oh, uh, anyway, um, uh, we we all did it differently, the three of us. Mm. Uh, sorry, it reminded me of Lewis Collins and, Lewis Collins and, and, and Martin Shaw. Martin Shaw, yeah. macho guy, just did it, just <laughs> ran. So we queued, he ran. But I, <laughs> but I was a, a you know a, a, a nothing anyway. So uh, I reversed, let myself over the edge, hung with my fin fingertips, and dropped the last four feet. 
which was quite enough. Mm. And uh, Lewis Collins essentially did the same. Mm. He didn't jump, but uh, Martin Shaw was, uh, you know, full full blooded male. Anyway, obviously the se the sequence that bit of the sequence was so awkward. <laughs> they just cut it out. But that was a dangerous thing to be asked to do. And it and uh, and all he did was get all the director did was get impatient. He did it didn't occur to him that he, he might have a damaged actor. Yeah. And so so that's very, very well known in the business. You will find people's and, and because actors are terrified that they will not be asked to work again, you know. Hmm. And they'll sometimes do things that they shouldn't they're stupid to do. Well, I, I think it's a natural compulsion of an actor to say, if, if you ask you can do something, it's, oh, yes, I can. You know, it's, it's part of... Well, partly because, and, you know. because there are so many workers out, out of work, so actors out of work, mm -hmm. and you're not one of them at the time. Yeah. Uh, they think, oh, I'd better do this. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I, I've spoken to some people that have started off in the stunt world and then gone on to, to directing, and I think they are much more aware of when it comes to stunts, but most directors are just they're not being cruel or mean or uncaring they're just after that shot aren't they and the schedule yeah, exactly that. Exactly just sort of, that. Sort of get it done and with and with time you know they've got to get get it in by yeah yeah um the last question i had for you while it was just about because of course going from sort of smaller parts to then being a leading man in your own tv series just wondered what it was like to sort of lead a a, a, a company and sort of the responsibilities and how you sort of felt about doing that and for a number of years? Well, television is hugely different from the theatre. Mm. <clears throat> it's very com compartmentalised. You, 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 obviously, if you're a core, you have a core group in a sitcom, then it's really important that you get on and that you work well together. It can work without that sometimes, but it's unlikely to, and then it and it's hell anyway. So, so there is that core group, but the pressure of the work is so intense. There's no leisure because if you if you're the lead in sitcom, uh, the reason well, I, as I discovered because um, if you're playing a small part, the 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 rehearsal schedule is very strange. You you just work mornings or a long morning, and then you have the afternoon off. And the, the leads need that afternoon to learn it in the five days they've got, as it used to be five five days, and then record on the mm. sixth day. And so um, the really strange thing, which again I describe uh, some length, I think, in the book, mm. is. Uh, I never played anything major in sitcom. And then suddenly it was suggested <laughs> to me that I front a sitcom. Hmm. And my difficulty was how to play that character. Because um, the short version is I had never played my I had never played myself in my life. I didn't know who I was as a persona. And so I thought, um, what is this character like? And what, uh, fortunately, so I started to ask around, actually. I said um, to various people close to me and so on, and um, they all came up with the same thing. And they said, it's you. Mm -hmm. I said, oh. And then I had... The, the problem was thinking, how do I come on as me? And then I had to go right back to stuff of what I was like in class at school. You know, I tend to, I remember that I not remember a thing I said, but I knew I made people laugh. I never told jokes, but I made people laugh. And so, and so what Brian had done, he'd written this kind of quirky character with strange little, uh, you know, departures into a private world and all that. And I said, I suppose, and he said, I got that from you. Hmm. So I hadn't realised that people observing me saw me like that. 
<laughs> but fortunately, mm. I managed in the time of the first uh, episode rehearsal to get to get it, mm. and I managed. I think I got away with realizing and playing myself. Mm. But that it was it was extraordinary experience. So that's that was the problem there. It wasn't the fact that it was a that it was a lead. It was what to do with it. Yeah, yeah. You know. And, and did you find that you achieved a certain amount of recognition in the public? I mean, maybe not Richard Burton level, but, but were people kind of sort of coming up oh, to you? Oh, well, the, well yeah, the, the weird thing is that from the very early days of sitcom, just being in one or two episodes, mm. for year after year after year, I had a phase of possibly 20 years mm. of whenever I was in public, somebody would stop me. Yeah. And it went on incredibly late. And I mean, the last one was not that long ago and I've got a beard. And there was a guy driving, driving a lorry, came up, I was in a car mm. with Anna and he said, hello, <laughs> I, I remember you. I said, mm. How do you remember you? <laughs> so people, people have extraordinary ways of recognizing it. Mm. And so, I mean, I, I've signed countless bits of paper yeah. <clears throat> and anywhere and everywhere. I mean, even in New York, I was, I was stopped in New York because people had seen the show in England and so on. Yeah, I, I was at the top of the Empire State Building in New York when somebody approached me and said, are you in that show? It's amazing what television does. I, mean, I think that's a very sign of being pretty you know of, of fame right there isn't it you're top of the empire state but somebody knows who you are yeah, absolutely really just good. totally weird mm. totally yeah. weird yeah i mean uh, a lot of actors i speak to say like they can found into act but it's it's quite strange that they know you but you don't know them it's sort of like they have sort That's of right. and right. they come and they pretend you know, and they act like they know you but of course it's a much a bit weird it's an interesting thing because um that's why I noticed that most actors are extremely generous and helpful with people that want their autographs or whatever want to, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, after a while, you know, people mm -hmm. might get bored. Yeah, yeah, bored enough, yeah. But, <clears throat> but I've only ever noticed one actor, and again, I write about this, who actually was rude to a fan. Oh. It was at the BBC canteen, actually, in television <laughs> centre. Uh, and uh, it was very strange. Because I thought your life depends on these people. Well, they don't yeah. come up and ask you. If they don't talk to you, you've had it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, reputation is kind of everything, isn't it? And if you're not recognized, you... as soon as you're recognized, and there is, I'm, again, I've got a bit of a theory about why. I don't know why people want to talk to you and get things to sign and mm. almost say, Can I touch you? It's yeah. very interesting. Mm. And I, I tr I'd go there a bit in the book, and yeah. I've got theories about that. I, I'm been to lots of stage doors and been the, the fan asking for autographs, and I think they're sort of it's a they want a connection, don't they? They want to sort of do their favourite show or something about that maybe connected with their childhood or something that's deeply to them or their partner. It's sort of like you're you're now part of their journey in some small way. So I think it's something. You know that's a that's, that's a you know a tip of maybe you know the iceberg of it. You know, yes. Um, uh, uh, if you want, <clears throat> I can expand on that. If you if you have wanted to pick it up some other time, <clears throat> I've yeah. got a. It's hard to know for sure, but yeah. I've got a an idea as to what it might be, and it's I think it's socially rather interesting. Yeah, because of course it 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 all. Fandom involves all huge areas of activity. I mean, mm. it's not just actors, obviously. Yeah. You know, it's all kinds of people who are prominent. Yeah. Who then have followers or have people that want to mm. be within the aura or the boundary or the area of influence of that person or say I was near him or I near her, you know. Yeah. The vibes came over. <laughs> yeah, I'd be very interested to go in, into that view at, at some point. Yeah, that'd be uh, be really nice. Thank you, Robert.
Um, well, thank you for another wonderful chat, and um, it's been uh, nice to see you again. Fantastic. Great to see you again. And you, Robert. Take, take, take care. Have a nice weekend. Bye, Bye for now. Yeah. Bye.